the story opens with the narrator describing how the genetic mutation reshuffled the law of the world. Because of that reshuffling, where some individuals will turn into superhumans and enjoy the prime of life, others will be controlled by their bloodlust and transform into abominations. It all will happen as if resistance was futile, and it was all fated to happen like that. In that scenario, if someone is abandoned by the world, bad luck shall be her constant companion. It will take everything from the individual by leading him to the destruction of all that he has. A girl with a disfigured face and scattered hair says that in the middle of the chaos, she thought about what kind of fate had been inflicted upon her and that if she did not do anything, her bad luck would not let her off the hook. She adds she resisted all that she had and got the chance to be reborn. A boy in the middle of his transformation into a monster narrates, placing everything on the line that he had his left arm mutated. Then he found himself wearing a long red gown among the superhumans. There he only had the opportunity to devour and evolve. There he proceeded with his evolution. He confronted monsters in bulk. Here he swears that disregarding all the misfortunes that befallen him from now on, he will be the writer of his fate. The scene shifts to a chaotic scenario, where a disastrous blast can be seen with so many monster-looking beings gathered around it. The sky is red with fire, and the buildings beneath it are demolished. A monster appears and says a year before, he was still a human being. But now he has become the lord of the monsters. Everywhere around him, there is fire, smoke, burning buildings, and a plethora of monsters running like insects. He grunts loudly and says it was around 10 years ago when monster genes started appearing in human beings. He adds that once these genes awaken in the human body, the person will inevitably turn into a monster. He continues and says once that happens, the human brain will be filled with an insatiable hunger and will be controlled by an unknown consciousness from deep within. He then reveals that's how he becomes a monster. He closes his hands tightly, then punches a hard rock and crushes it into small pieces. Small pieces of stones spread in the air. He then attacks some people. People shout out of fear. He says no one would ever think that those who turned into a monster would have any shred of humanity left in them. He then taps his foot wildly on the ground and a flash of light sparks out of it. He crushes people like insects under his feet. The mutated girl comes and stands in front of the monster and asks him to leave this to her. The girl tries to protect the people. While she is doing so, a purple light comes out of her. Taking advantage of her refuge, people ran away from the monster. The girl calls the monster Zinkun and tells her not to let the mutation go to his mind. Hearing this, the monster stops for a moment. The girl notices that the monster is hesitant to do such things. The monster stands still and stares at the girl. The girl says a monster who lost his mind does not act like this. With a spark of hope in her eyes, the girl looks at the monster and wonders if there is a chance of his rebirth. The Zinkun becomes angry and says that stupid girl would not give up on me, though he has become like this. He turns black because of anger, roars and swings his hand in the form of a punch towards the girl. When his punch is about to hit the girl's head, he stops and thinks even though he has muted into a monster, she is still trying to awaken his human mind. The girl touches his hand softly and says that it is good. She holds his hand and happily says finally, he is back. Zinkun holds his punched hand with his other hand in his attempt not to hurt the girl and says he is already at his limit in stopping from hurting the girl. Three monsters approach the girl and roar. Zinkun closes his eyes and holds his head with both of his hands. The girl appreciates his attempt and says keep it up. Zinkun growls and says he cannot control his monster self. The girl looks at him with tears in her eyes. Zinkun loses control over his human mind, punches the girl wildly, and almost kills her. Zinkun roars in anger, slams the ground, and destroys things around him. As Zinkun attacks the girl again, she raises her hand toward him and tells him not to let himself be controlled by the monster any further. As the girl's reflection appears in his eyes, he thinks that he should not be like this. His monster eyes turn into human eyes, and he calls out to the girl, Jai Jiu. The girl has fallen to the ground by then. Hungry monsters run toward the girl to tear her into pieces and eat. That is when Zinkun takes control of himself and shouts at the other monsters. He tells them to stay away from the girls and tears them into pieces. That seems late. He shouts out of disdain and calls them detestable beings who destroyed the world. Some monsters fly toward him and attack him. He stricks them back and keeps killing these monsters. He yells at himself and says he should have gained control earlier. 
He calls out the name of Zhai Ziyu and revives back into his human appearance. He seems confused. He asks him if he was not killed by other monsters back then. He sprays a cologne on his face and coughs. Later, he looks at the bottle and asks if it is cologne. He touches his face and tries to recognize himself. He tries to pick something from the ground, where there is a white bag lying beside it, along with a bill. The bill shows the date of the 15th of June and the year 2025. Zinkun reflects that it was the sixth day after his entrance examination and the day before his genetic testing. He adds tomorrow is the day when he will find out that his genome contains the monster gene. He says that he will have a locator installed in his body and will be discriminated against the cause of fear. And then he will be excluded from society as he is some kind of ticking time bomb. He looks at himself in the mirror. Meanwhile, a girl's voice comes, saying that she can hear her calling other women's names. On hearing the voice, he turned back and looked toward the steamed glass door of the bathroom. He thinks he finally got a new chance in life. He stares at the shadow reflection of the girl. He coughs and says he cannot be called a good gay. Then he checks some messages on his phone. There are also pictures of Zhai Ziyu with a typed message below. He says in this life, he will surely protect Zhai Ziyu. He adds that while he cannot change the fact that his body contains the monster gene, he will control it in this life. He thinks he should be well prepared for when his monster self will be awakened fully. He thinks he still has a year before it happens. He says with determination that this time, he will make the monsters who destroyed the world pay. He says he has a plan for that. His heart throbs. When he holds his chest to calm his heart down, his muted arm's skin becomes torn and light sparks. It seems he is about to evolve into the monster self again. He thinks he should not awaken his monster self a year later. The main reason for mutation is when one's emotions cross a certain threshold. He thinks he must have crossed it when he awakes. Meanwhile, the girl comes out of the bathroom and calls out Zinkun. He was in the middle of his evolution by then. He thinks he should execute his plan a little earlier. There is no way back once mutation starts. The girl appears out of the bathroom and starts walking towards Zinkun. Zinkun represses his mutation to the point that the girl would not notice it. He holds his arm tightly to reverse the mutation. The girl puts her hand on his shoulder. Zinkun says he still needs some time to get rid of the debt that he got himself into. He turns back to the girl and says that she is just one of the intimate friends of him and adds he is a scum, and he does not worthy of having any of them. He comes out of the rooms among many girls and says all of them separate going forward. A red-haired girl aggressively replies to him what is he even saying? She tells him to look at his abs and says that she waited for so long for him to reach his legal age. How can he say this to her? She says that all of them could have tried earlier to convince him, but they thought that Jiei could convince him to change his mind. All of the girls hold him. One of them says that they can share his love equally. Another girl says that he does not know how charming he is. Another girl asks him to give her a chance. Zinkun says shit. He knows that he always had a thing for elder sister kind of girls previously, so he found himself a bunch of the same type of girls. He gets himself free from the girls and runs away from them. The girls lunatically run after him. He tells them that he is a carrier of the monster gene. He can accidentally kill all of them, so they should break up. The red-haired girl says to him how can he say that when he is not even tested for that. Another girl says that even if he is a carrier, that does not matter to her, she is fine with that. He quickly runs out of the corridor. As he steps out of the building, he says all of these women are liars. He says back then, when they all discovered that he was a carrier, they all left him as quickly as they learned, except Zhai Ziyu. He looks at Zhai Ziyu and says even still, she is standing here for him. Zhai Ziyu looks back at him with a smile on her face. As he comes closer to her, she says that he has got his heart torn by seven of his good friends. She offers him something and says she has brought him Yunnan Baiyao and tells him to see if that can cure his promiscuous nature. He holds her face with love and says that he would not let her wait any longer and that he would not let her have any regrets this time. Shocked, Jai Ziyu looks at Zinkun and asks him why he is acting so weird today. She asks him why he is so touchy and all today. As Zinkun comes close to her and tries to be intimate with her, she asks him what he is doing and asks if he is trying to kiss her. Zinkun's heart throbs and his emotions cross the set limit with which his monster self tries to dominate. He realizes that and says shit. His monster self is getting anxious with hunger. His facial features start to change and he becomes a monster. 
He somehow manages to reverse the mutation. Jai Ziyu asks him if he is okay. He replies he is just hungry and says he needs to take care of his hunger first. He runs away from her and tells her to wait for him at home. He will come and find her after a while. Jai Ziyu asks him if he is hungry, then where is he going? He stops outside a garment store and reads somewhere that, according to statistics, almost 5% of the population is the carrier of the monster gene. He thinks that is the reason that society has not descended to chaos yet, because only those who carry the monster gene will be able to mutate into monsters. He wears a long red gown and walks among the crowd. He says that people would always say that as long as the gene carriers can control themselves or kill themselves once they mutate, society will remain peaceful. He adds that these are just useless morality talks. In reality, any normal person would not hesitate to kill someone who carries the monster gene. His eyes shine, and he says it looks like he found something to eat. Meanwhile, someone loudly says that it looks like it is happening again a mutation attack in the cinema and commercial district. They can see a building burning into a blazing fire. People run here and there and ask for help. A monster tries to catch a man and begs him not to eat him while helplessly running away from him. Zinkun stands still and sees all these things happening around him. The running man thinks, why is he standing still there? The man pushes him in front of the monster and says, if that is the case, then go ahead and die in place of him. The monster growls loudly. Zinkun looks at the monster. The monster ignores him and runs after the man again. He wondered why he ignored him. It seemed that he identified him as one of them. The running man thinks that he has dodged the monster and tells Zinkun that he should not blame him. Meanwhile, the monster reaches him. Zinkun laughs slightly and says he is sorry, and it seems that now he can eat without any worry. The running man, with a drenched face and runny nose, looks back at Zinkun and becomes shocked. How is that possible that the monsters spared that man? He asks himself why are not they eating him? Zinkun walls fearlessly among the monsters. Zinkun says that there is another reason why society has not crumbled quite yet. And that reason is that those who had awakened powers from within, the Transcended One, have established a special department for them. The Extermination Department. He says he will leave it up to them. A group of people who managed to get a hold of their monster self held a stone wall between the monsters and the normal people to protect them from the hungry monsters. Two saviors try to hold the stone wall with their powers. A yellow light sparks out of their hands. One of the two saviors asks the other one if all the people evacuated from the building. The other one replies no, Lin Chai is still inside there. Seeing the level of destruction, one of them says that a level 2 monster has been born. The other one says that Lin Chai is a gifted fighter, so there must not be any problem. Stones spread into the air as fire lashes out of the building. The scene shifts inside the building. A boy fights a huge monster with an arm lost to the hungry monster and holds a child in the other one. He tries to hide two more kids behind him with blood spilling out badly from one of her shoulders. He says that an arm in exchange for three children is a huge loss for him. The hungry monsters roar. He speaks out fatal flames and throws big flames of fire at the monsters. He says he cannot believe that he has lost her one arm to a level 2 monster. His reputation as a gifted fighter is at stake. Meanwhile, Zinkun reaches over there and punches the monster in the neck. Lin Chai looks at Zinkun and thinks who he is, who appears to be even more pretentious than him. Lin Chai thinks that he has beaten the level 2 monster with his bare fist. He thinks, where did this rogue transcender come from? What are his powers? How did he become this strong? Zinkun again punches the monster, looks back at Lin Chai, and says it looks like this place requires a cleanup. Lin Chai replies that he should not let his guard down as the rank 2 monsters cannot be killed that easily. He asks him for help in taking the kids safely out of the building. Lin Chai says then he can leave the rest to him, and he will manage them single-handedly. Zinkun says hi to him and smiles. However, Lin Chai looks worried because of something. Meanwhile, he attacks Lin Chai and she falls. He says it is not good to watch others eat. The monster roars and says how dare a low-grade scum like him dare to steal his prey. Zinkun replies to the monster that he took that part wrong. He says it is he who is prey here, and he throws a ball of fire towards the monster. The monster says that it is the flame of the Lord. Why does he possess it? Zinkun attacks the monster and replies that he would not believe him once he was their Lord, and even he possessed the power to retrieve the position back. The monster asks him why he is going to eat him. 
They both belong to the same species, they are the power of the king. But Zinkun jumps at him, dominates, and eats him anyway. Seeing this, other monsters growl and call him a traitor. The monster moans out the word king again. Zinkun ridicules him and says that he will soon knock down that scary being whom they call their so-called king. The half-dead monster moans that it would not be easy to kill him. He again takes a big bite of the monster's black flesh to calm his hunger. The scene shifts outside the district, where there is massive destruction. One of the saviors notices that the monsters have become weaker because of some reason. He says that they do not seem to be as united as they were before. He adds it is easy to deal with them like this. The saviors attack the monsters with fire, flames, and stones. One of them calls another lieutenant and asks him what the situation is. The other one replies that if there is a high-ranked monster among the monsters, then the lower-ranked ones fight and unite with the higher-ranked one as their leader. But seeing this, they are losing their unity, which must mean that Lin Chai has killed the rank 2 monster within the district. He swings his fist and attacks the monster. He then tells his comrade that Lin Chai must have killed the monster. He adds he is so jealous of her for controlling his transcended powers. One of them says there is no problem outside the district, so they should go inside and check. They step in and call out the name of Lin Chai. As per their expectations, the rank 2 monsters lay dead on the floor. One of them notices that there are still three kids. The other one asked Lin Chai what happened to his arm. He adds he is unable to understand how much things got screwed up right now. He tells Lin Chai that he does not worry about his lost arm. Lin Chai becomes angry and says that he can still kill him with one arm. He replies that Lin Chai can show off as much as he can because he has saved three children, stopped the monster horde, and even killed a second grade monster. Lin Kai holds his wounded arm and replies that it was not he who killed the monster. He tells them that an idiot knocked him down coldly after killing the monster. She adds she saw him eating the monster when she woke up. He tells them his left arm is burning with some blue flames. He tells them that he saw his face and can recognize him if he sees him again. One of them says to ignore whether you can recognize him or not and asks him if he saw him eating the flesh of the monster. He further asks if he is not a monster himself. The other one says there are cases when some monster eats another monster, but if that is the case, then Lin Chai would also have been eaten by that monster. The first one says that they need to put a warrant for that person for having the power to defeat a rank 2 monster, and for forcefully intercepting an exterminator's rescue operation. Zinkun took off his red gown and started leaving the place. Rumors start to spread that an unregistered transcender is suspected to have muscle-strengthening powers with the metallic type of attributes or possibly fire attributes. The rumors include that the unregistered transcender is suspected to have pika disorder and antisocial personality disorder. Ignoring all these rumors, Zinkun keeps walking. He burbs and says that he is feeling so full. People think that those transcenders who have this proud and arrogant attitude and who think that they can do a way better job than those who are trained to do so will go out of control in society in the future. So, it is better to eliminate those people from society. Zinkun says that people think that the earliest stage of evolution is the easiest, but it is still surprising that he directly evolved to the second rank. Then he thinks that now he should go home. After reaching outside the building of his apartment, he says that it is good to see that his apartment is still intact and the buildings in this area still stand strong. He remembers that in his previous life, dealing with all the girls, it was already 3 o'clock in the morning when he got back. It is still dark all around. The whole community was experiencing a blackout. He says that it was not just his area experiencing the massive blackout, but a very large area of the residential district also experienced that blackout. He says that it was apparent that all of the electrical energy had been redirected and absorbed by Jai Ziyu, who was at his home at that time. He tells Jai Ziyu lost control because of her initial awakening of superpowers and destroyed the whole apartment complex she was living in. All 136 people who were living in that complex, including her parents, died. That incident caused her to have severe mental trauma along with a scar that would not heal on her face. He looks at his cell phone to know what time it is. He tells himself that it is still four more hours to 33. He thinks that he still has enough time. He notices the street light and says that the street light should not be off around that time. He thinks about what is going on here. On the other hand, Jai Ziyu gets perplexed at her awakening. She emits a purple light. She sweats badly in her attempt to control herself. 
She says she cannot move otherwise the electricity leaks out. She cries and calls out her mom and dad. She feels trapped because she cannot move. She speaks to herself. It is what people call the uncontrolled awakening. She says that she can feel the electricity coursing in her body continuously. She feels it is difficult to control herself. She fears that she might hurt her parents. She says that she cannot control herself any longer and calls out if someone can help her. She calls out Zinkun's name. Zinkun enters the room and says to Zhai Jiu that now he is here, so she needs not worry. She asks her how he comes up here. He says there is no time to explain. He asks her to trust him. She says yes. He tells her not to scream no matter how scared she may feel. Otherwise, her parents may get up. He grabs her arm. She tells her to wait and says there is electricity around her. She says she can feel the electricity being redirected into Zinkun's body. She notices Zinkun's arm turn black, but he is still fine. Zinkun tells her that he cannot maintain direct contact with her for a long time and excuses her for that. He tells her that they should go to the rooftop. They jump out of the window. In the middle of the air, Zhai Jiu cries out of fear that she will fall. Using his power he holds her in the middle of the air and tells her to hold him tightly. He says that when he killed the rank 2 monsters he found out that he got a new ability of tentacles. With the help of the tentacles he saves her and takes her to the rooftop. He takes her down and tells her that she is going to electrocute him to death. He tells her to release her electricity there quickly. He directs towards the sky and tells her to pour all of it into the sky. She says yes to him and directs all her electric power to the sky. Zinkun says finally they made it on time so the unfortunate events from the last time will not be repeated. She tells Zinkun that now she is fine. Zinkun says it is good to hear. She asks him about his hand. He tells her that he has mutated into a monster, but luckily he managed to limit it to his left arm. She says he should not say it loudly. She puts her hands on his mouth and says he should not tell anyone about it. She says that he knows that many people around there despise monsters. She says he would be in danger once someone finds out the truth about him. She adds he can only tell her an excuse about that. Zinkun laughs after hearing that. She asks him what is he laughing at. She says it is a serious business here, he should not take it as a jock. He says of course he will be honest with her since she is the one who asked him. Zinkun holds her tightly by her shoulders and says that she is the one in this world that he has unconditional trust in. She says she can bet that he has told the same things to the seven of her girlfriends. He denies that. She says, who would believe him anyway? She says, wow, the stars are so pretty and tells her to look at the most glowing one. She says that even if it is the falling start, he would not close his eyes and make a wish with her. He asks what she is talking about. It seems to be someone from the genetic research lab. A flying jet appears in sight. Zinkun says to Zhai Jiu that since her power caused that much of a stir just now, someone must have come to find her. Soon, a doctor and a nurse appeared on the rooftop. The nurse says there are two people on the rooftop. Both nurse and doctor run toward them. The doctor says one of them is most likely the one who released a lot of uncontrolled power. The doctor tells them they are from the Genetic Research Institute, so they should not be afraid of them. The doctor asks which one of them released the electric power. Zhai Jiu replies it was her. The doctor says that is fine she did the right thing as it prevented a lot of damage by being on the rooftop. The doctor tells the nurse Ziolu to give them the reagent test for transcenders. She replied yes and took out two test tubes. The doctor says that perhaps the boy has also awakened some transcended powers since he is completely unharmed even in the midst of that much uncontrolled power. The doctor says to them do not worry he will take a little bit of their blood. They say that is fine. The doctor takes out their blood sample. Seeing this, there are flames in their blood. The doctor is amazed and asks what sort of godlike reaction is that. The blood sample of Zhai Jiu starts to spark out with fire flames. The doctor says he is going blind. The blood of the girl is going to surpass the record of having the highest percentage of the descended gene. When the nurse tries to take Zinkun's blood sample, he says to her that she is wasting a precious reagent test on him. The nurse looks at his blood sample and says the boy also has the descended gene, but the reaction seems quite weak. The doctor covers his eyes to protect them from the light coming out of the blood sample of Jai Jiu and tells the nurse to bring the sample of the also to the lab. Zinkun thinks it is only a faculty test kit. He remembers that he only got the monster gene in him. 
Then he remembers something and says that the monster must have eaten the arm of the exterminator, and he devours that monster. The scene shifts to the Nanyu Genetic Research Faculty Transcended Detection Chamber 13. Zinkun undergoes a checkup there. While checking, the nurse says to Zinkun that he is amazing as he has the lowest amount of transgender genes of 1%. She further tells him that it is amazing that he has the lowest amount of genes, yet he has a strong body, and says in her heart that she wants to touch his body. She holds his shirt while checking him. Zinkun thinks it seems like his body turns strong after his mutation. He asks the nurse if he can put his shirt down. He thinks now he has transcended genes. It is because he is a half-monster or has eaten a monster who has consumed some transcender's flesh. Then he thinks, who cares, whatever the real reason is. He then thinks that if he obtains more transcended genes, he will be able to enter the Nanyu Institute, which is better than being detected with monster genes and under constant surveillance. He asks the nurse if he still be able to enter the research institute with only 1% of the gene. The nurse says that the institute's dean says he is allowed to enroll as soon as he has transcendent genes. She adds that from now onwards she will be his senior sister. The nurse tries to help him. Zinkun says all the big sister types of girls are quite caring. The nurse tells him to rest then she will help him with registration. Zinkun says thanks to the nurse. People say they heard that the world record has been broken and about 95% of the genes transcended. And that is more than the previous record of the 2%. Doctors run in the corridor of the research institute. Zinkun notices that they are going to do an attribute test right now and says he will see how awesome the world's number one is. He says before he was caught off guard with 99% mutated monster genes, he never noticed the chaos that GU's results caused. He thinks to have a look at that. Doctors stand outside Ziyu's transcended detection chamber in a state of panic. One of the doctors says that they have given her an electric shock of 500 volts she is still fine. He adds she is completely immune to any amount of industrialized electricity. The doctor further says that she is expected to have a prodigy of 95% if transcended genes. Seeing this, Zinkun says that if she can release 500 volts of electricity without any problem, then 91% of the rank 1 transcenders would not even be able to come close to her. One of the doctors says that he is so jealous of these prodigies because the amount of resistance they can take is the same amount they can attack. Another doctor says a few years ago someone had the same attribute and had 89% of the transcended genes he could only take 1000 volts of electricity when he awakened, so she should also be able to take 1000 volts of electricity. The technician increases the electricity volts to 600 volts. Jiu says she is fine. The technician increases the volts to 700 volts and then increases it to 800 volts, 900 volts, and then to 1000 volts step by step. Jiu takes 1000 volts easily. Zinkun says awesome on that. They raise the level of electricity first to 1200 volts and then to 2 million volts. Jiu takes that many volts. Seeing this doctor say is she even a human or not? The technician asks Jiyu if is she feeling all right. She replies that she is not feeling anything at all. The doctors say this is too much and she has just awakened. One of them says that he has heard that once one has more than 90% transcended genes, one's power will increase exponentially by 1% for each. He adds maybe this is the situation here. Meanwhile, they increase the level of electricity by 2800 to 3000% volts. Jiyu says they should stop here. The technician asks if is she at her limit. She says no. She says she has not released all of her electricity by then, and now she has absorbed all these volts. She says she feels like she will lose control if they will continue. And then she may accidentally destroy this place. The technician says the data shows 3000 volts. Zinkun tells the technician that he is her friend and asks him to let him enter the chamber. The technician replies that he cannot enter right now as she has a large amount of electricity within her. So, let her release all that energy first to avoid any accident. Two persons enter the corridor, one wearing a long white coat over a formal suit and the other wearing a formal white suit. They ask the technician to open the door and let them enter the chamber. Zinkun checks out them. The technician says nice to meet you to the one wearing a long white coat and calls him Dean. The dean says that there is no harm in letting them go inside the chamber as that much electricity would not harm them. He adds Shizai, the one wearing the white formal suit will help her release some electricity. He replies it is good to hear that dead fan and his third nephew are there to help the girl. 
Shizai tells Jiyu that he is pleased to meet her. Jiyu tells her not to come close. Her electricity might harm him. She adds she needs to find a way to release some of it. Shizai says then they reach here on time. He says his fire will help him to block some of the electricity. Jiyu looks back at him. He adds then she will not harm anyone. He says he has heard her cute name from the researchers here. He adds he is pleased to meet her for the first time. He takes his hand towards her and introduces himself as Fan Shizai. He tells her that he will be her future classmate at the Nanyu Institute. Zinkun says that this gay has his sights on her for sure, and he is acting as if no one here is noticing that. Zinkun becomes jealous and says that he has dog-like looks. Jiyu says she is also pleased to meet him, but she cannot hold his hand because she still has some electricity. Shizai says they still have time to get to know each other. He adds he is not going to disturb her rest for long, so he will just say a few things. He says that when they start their school year, they will be divided into groups. He adds the result of their assignments will decide how much resources they can use. He says as the third young master of the fan family, he was tested to have 90% of the high-quality transcended genes. He says that he is hopeful about forming a strong team in the institute and receiving the best resources for the team. He adds he hopes that she will join their team. Jiyu says it is great to hear that he invited her to join the team, but she already has a teammate with her. He says that the person who was with her. She replies yes. He says his mate's test results are quite weak, so his percentage would not be higher either. Meanwhile, Zinkun asks the technician if he can enter the chamber now. Shizai thinks the strong will remain strong and the weak will remain weak. He speaks to himself that a teammate should not hold back others if he is weak, and he hopes that Jiyu will reconsider his offer later. Seeing Zinkun entering the chamber, Jiyu runs towards her and says to him that she hopes that they will be classmates in the future. Zinkun replies of course they will. Assistant Dean calls out Shizai and says that they should go now as they have other things to do. Shizai tells Jiyu that he is leaving now and says that he is hopeful that she will reconsider her proposal later. Later he tells his uncle that the girl is a genius with 95% transcended genes and he wants to take her in for their family. Dean replies that she already has someone, so he would not succeed no matter how hard he may try. Then he says to his uncle to remove that obstacle. They hear someone saying on the phone that the test result of the boy named Zinkun is the lowest in history and the percentage of the transcended genes is only 1%. The dean says that a person with 1% transcended genes is equal to human beings, and enrolling him in the institute means wasting the resources of the institute. The person on the other side of the phone call says, but the dean insisted on enrolling anyone as long as the person has transcended genes. The assistant dean replied angrily as if his words meant nothing to him. The person on the call becomes quiet. The assistant dean says to Shizai that he needs not to worry about the obstacle, at least as long as he does not appear in front of them. He adds it will be fine. Shizai praises his uncle by saying he knows his business. The scene shifts to Jiyu and Zinkun. Jiyu tells Zinkun that he needs to feed himself to stop his mutated arm from rampaging, as it is the side effect of his mutation. He tells her that sometimes it makes him crave human flesh. She says then it is nothing to worry about. There are plenty of bad boys around there. He says she cannot say that sort of thing so easily. He adds this side of her personality is quite dangerous. A nurse comes to their room and tells Jiyu that her parents are at the reception. Hearing this, she says that is great. She says to Zinkan that she is good at catching people, so she will not be caught easily by someone. He replies this is not the problem here. She tells him that she will share the good news with her parents. While leaving, she smiles and says that she is happy that she will be in the same school as him as before. She thanks the nurse. Zinkun asks the senior nurse that she seems down if everything is okay with her. The nurse tells him that she is sorry to tell him that his enrollment in the institute has been declined. She tells him that they are saying that a person with 1% of descended genes is no different than a normal human. He asks that if not, tell him that a person with any amount of descended genes can enroll in the institute. She says that is what they said before. The nurse seems angry at their decision. She says so, what if he has only 1%? If he has it, he has it. She says she will help him in applying again. She says if the first time does not work, she will make it happen a second time. She adds even if it means applying for the 800 times. He says he is thankful for her help, but there is no need to do that. He adds there are the ones with the right to do so. 
He says she will get in trouble if she tries to help him. He says worse comes to worse. So he has to use his monster genes to enroll in the institute. He says that Nanyu Institute has all the resources that he needs to become stronger, so he has to get in at any cost. She says she is not afraid. Meanwhile, her phone rings. She tells him that they are giving him another chance for enrollment. Hearing this, Zinkun thinks for a while. The scene shifts to the assistant dean's office. Shizai forms a blazing ball of fire on his hand and thinks that the administration has given the boy a chance to participate in the last test. Those who are unable to awaken their power within a year in the Nanyu Institute for the Transcenders are encouraged to drop out, and the last test is created as a last chance for them to remain in the Institute. Shizai thinks, why are they giving someone who is not even a student of the Institute to participate in that test? He throws fire in the air and burns so many moths. Then he crushes a moth with his shoe and says no matter how hard that boy tries, he will be no better than a moth. The assistant dean calls out Shizai while holding a glass of red wine in his hand and says moths become annoying during these days of the year. He tells Shizai that the last test was King Chai's idea. He replies that it is the decision of the dean of the institute, but why is that? The assistant dead says that was the dean's warning for him not to cross his lines again. He adds the dean is pissed off that they have broken the rules and if the boy passed that test that it would be a slap on his face. He further says that if the boy failed the test, the dean would be seen as protecting his honor. Shirai says that they should try to prevent him from passing the test, otherwise their family's reputation would be ruined. The assistant dean says that he would not pass as his 1% genes would not let him enter their world. Shizai said with an evil smile that they would not either let him enter. He adds that King Chai's decision will only prove that he is wasting resources, and he is no longer worthy of having the title of dean. The scene shifts to another chamber. A worker says to the other worker they have to check and make sure that all the testing equipment is safe within five days. One of them asks worker Lai if he is all right as he is acting like himself right now. He replies he is fine, he becomes careless for some time. Then, the former asks the latter to go on as they have plenty of work to do. Then, worker Zhao receives a message of getting one million for some illegal task. He thinks it is worth more than his job. He tells the chief director that he has completely checked someone's background and that person does not have a strong back. The chief director smiles and checks Zinkun's record. He says the boy with 1% of genes has not even entered the institute. But the boy has stabbed the butt of the fan family and they invested 20 million to fail him in the test. He thinks once this is over, his life will be much easier. He tells the worker Zhao, his partner, that they need to complete this job. Five days pass, and the test starts. The chief director looks at the big screen to observe all the test participants. He observes Zinkun exclusively and notices that he is looking quite weak. He thinks this boy is here for the test. Why does it look like the boy has not eaten anything for days? He thinks if he faces monsters like this, he will end up dead. He says it seems like he needs not to do anything to fail him in the test. The only thing Zinkun thinks is that he is hungry. He says his stored energy has depleted, and he is so hungry that his tongue can touch his back. He says he wants to eat all of the people that are present there. He says their bodies still have some unawakened genes like doormats. The test begins and Zhao announces that there will be three hours for three rounds of life and death matches. There will be three tickets for the continuation of the studies. Zhao tells the participants to remember that this is their last chance to return to the institute. Worker Zhao further announces that there are a total of 18 participants, including one who is not a student of the institute, and says his background does not matter. All the 17 students of the institute simultaneously look at Zinkun. Zhao, who is doing the comparison, says it is fair enough that the number of tickets remains the same. He then asks them if they are ready to retrieve the tickets while the monsters attack them. One of the students says what he means by fair enough. There are so many people and only three tickets. The other student says the boy must have been bribed to reach there. Another becomes angry about the privilege given to Zinkun. One of them says they can use him as bait later. Zinkun thinks that it seems that he has made some enemies. With his mouth watering, he thinks there is more food here. Then he thinks that he cannot simply eat people. Zhao takes Zinkun to chamber number 18 and tells him this is his chamber. He asks the man if he did not do that on purpose. Zhao asks what does he mean? He says that to cut it short, he can sense the blood on the gate is the blood of a high-ranking transcender, and it will attract monsters. 
Zhao says to Zinkun that he knows his stuff. He tells Zinkun that he has offended the Fan family. He says the monsters will rush toward his chamber when the test begins. He says it is too bad that this chamber had been used as the 18 testing chamber. He adds it will be terrible when the lock is also broken. Zhao says he should not forget that these monsters are five times stronger than humans. He says not to mention that these monsters release air as tough as metal. It won't be good if they come rushing here. He says they will tear him into shreds and turn him into a meat delicacy fit for their taste. He tells him his only chance for survival is to exit from the back door. But that also means that he is giving up. Zhao says they will not stop him. After all, they wanted him to relinquish his right to enrollment. Zhao further says that they do not want his life. He suggests that he should give up. This will save his life, and the Fan family will also get what they want. And everyone wins. Then he says he is just giving him 10 seconds to quit. Zinkun calls him and says if someone is a delicacy he is. Zhao replies he will see how long he lasts. The scene shifts to the control room. Zhao goes to the office of the chief director and says everything is going smoothly. He tells him that he can bet that Zinkun is scared right now. The chief director says that he will only survive if he quits. He adds that monsters would only take 10 more minutes to reach his chamber. The chief director says he bets on a hundred bucks, he will give up in five seconds. The chamber opens and the monsters appear. They roar wildly. Someone announces the beginning of the last test. The monsters jump into the space in the center of the chambers. The chief director and worker Zhao laugh and say let's begin the countdown. Zinkun opens the doors of his chambers. Both of them become stunned at this action and wonder if he is trying to die. Then they say what matters, the monsters will tear him into pieces and he will not blame anyone for his death. Three monsters jump at Zinkun, but he stands, remains calm, and says come here food. The monsters ignore him and move towards other chambers. He says how can he forget that they can identify him as one of them. He says he is so hungry. Zhao shouts why are the monsters ignoring him. The chief director says that the blood on the gate is more attractive than the boy. Zhao says that means he helped the boy by smearing the blood on the gate. He says how bad his genes are that even the monsters do not want him. Zinkun takes the first ticket. Seeing this, the chief director says, what if he took the ticket? There are so many monsters. He adds that Wyan from class 2, who got his powers awakened during the attack at the industrial district, is in the test. He has a special power to detect the mental state of his target. Soon, Wyan jumped toward the ticket and said that the first ticket was his. The chief director says he is undoubtedly the strongest competitor in the test. Zinkun feels so hungry. Wyan's eyes spark and he says mental intimidation. He says let's see if his power scares the boy. He looks into Zinkun's eyes and sees a big monster. He gets scared and asks what is wrong with the boy's mind. He sweats badly. Wyan feels Zinkun's mental fortitude is stronger than his. He finds it difficult to bear the backlash of his power and blood from his nose, mouth, and ears. While detecting Zinkun's mental state, he sees him standing in front of a monster on the pile of skulls. He says it looks like he is more than a monster than a human. After being attracted by the blood, two out of the three monsters who attacked chamber number 18 turned back and looked toward Wine. They jump at Wine. Zinkun, who stands between the monsters and Wine, says they want to eat the person behind him. He says he is very hungry. He says to let him feed first on them. He says he will be careful while eating them so they will not even notice. A snake-like body comes out of his hand. He raises his hand toward the monster and starts consuming him. The monster roars badly. He says finally, after so many days, he gets a chance to eat monster meat. The monster attacks him now. Zinkun becomes angry and says he has just eaten a little bit of him, and he is looking at him like an enemy. Observing this, the chief director says Wine is useless, but the monsters will kill the brat anyway. Wine shouts at Zinkun that he cannot kill a monster. Meanwhile, Zinkun holds the monster from his mouth and drags him. They notice that Zinkun is strong. It seems like the attacks do not affect him. It appears that Zinkun is playing with them and knows them like the back of his hand. He adds that it seems that attacking them is his instinct. Zinkun pushes the monster with his single hand. They say that once a person has enough experience fighting with the monsters, killing them would be second nature to them. Wyan says one hit from the monster will turn the boy into a toast. Still, he is attacking any weak point of the monster. He thinks he is able to kill the monsters. Zinkun kills the monster. 
After that, he moves toward the second monster and kills him. Seeing this, Wyan thinks that he must have killed so many monsters in the past, which must be the reason that his mental fortitude is so strong. The chief director and Zhao, who were planning to prevent Zinkun from passing the test, say that they have not seen anyone killing the monsters like this. They think, what will they do now? Then the chief director says they should not be worried. The scene shifts back to the test location. One of the participants asks the other what they will do now. Another participant says it is normal to be aggressive since it is the last test for some of them. Then he looks at Zinkun and says they will not let him go so easily. He tells Zinkun to hand over the ticket and says that the ticket does not belong to him. Wyan tells the boy named Jia Sheng that the boy is quite dangerous. Jia Sheng tells Wyan that he is a coward frightened even before any attack from that boy. He adds it is disgusting that he considered him as his biggest rival before. Wyan tells Jia Sheng that he is not getting it. Jia Sheng says to Wyan that it is useless to talk to the shit like him. Jia Sheng tells others to surround him and snatch the ticket from him. One says remember that they will fight evenly for the ticket once they get it from him. Jia Sheng says do not worry, did he not say that the winner will treat the losers later? They say that they will follow Jia Sheng as their leader. Jia Sheng tells the bald boy to take care of the monster and not let him disturb them, and they will take care of the one who came here with the bribe. The bald boy stands before the monster and says it will be no problem for him. The other boy tells the bald boy that they need to lure the monster away. He folds his arms and replies there is no need for that. If that kid can kill two monsters easily, someone has rigged the test to be easier. He says they must have starved these poor fellows before releasing them in. The monster attacks him, and he punches the monster. His hand gets folded badly. The monster catches him from his face and beats him. Seeing this, the other boy gets scared. Seeing this, Jie Sheng becomes angry and says his muscles have grown to his brain. Zinkun raises his fist to punch Jie Sheng. Seeing this, Jie Sheng thinks that something is wrong with this boy. Zinkun thinks that he should kill Jie Sheng with his left hand. He says his left hand was already completely mutated, and after devouring the rank 2 monster, his hand had also evolved rank 2. Now he can release a tentacle that is around 8 meters long. He adds that his strength reached at least 10 times stronger than normal humans. He says his strength is equal to the strength of a rank 1 monster even when he is not in his monster state, and his one punch will free Jia Sheng's brain from his skull. He thinks he cannot kill someone right now, so he should be a little gentle with him. He punches Jia Sheng, and with a flash, his face turns back with the hit. Jia Sheng falls. Xin Kun says shit he has overestimated himself. He holds Jia Sheng and asks him if he is alright. Jia Sheng knows and mouth bleed badly. He says he is breathing, which means he is fine. Then he asks others if they still want his ticket. On the other hand, he runs toward them, holding the bald boy in his arms. He calls Jia Sheng for help and says that the monster has badly broken Baldi. Swinging one hand in the air, the monster runs after them. Badly injured Jia Sheng tells Zinkun that he cannot hold the monster back and begs him to help them. He holds Zinkun's leg and says he is sorry for blaming the bribe. He says he can take the ticket. Zinkun agrees to help him. The chief director says that all the participants are useless as they backed out. The chief director calls the control room and says they need to pressure the participants slightly more. So throw the monster number 21 to 23 in. He commands someone in the control room to release the monsters. That person says yes to the order. The chief director says that the monsters after rank 20 are peak monsters of rank 1 and are much stronger than the regular ones. The man in the white cap says that the brat would not survive an encounter with them and will die for sure. The chief director says he will not die because he has probably awakened his power. Even if not awakened his powers fully, then he is already halfway there. He says putting more monsters will only awaken his powers. They think about what they should do now. The chief director says that the monsters numbered above 20 in the experimental zone of the faculty are already open, and the door separating the experimental zone and the release door has already opened. The chief director says to the worker Zaho that he does not know how, but he has to go and release the gate on level 2 and destroy the main gate and power supplies of the participants' testing ground. The monsters growl in their chambers. Zhao says to the director that if he destroyed the main gate and the power supplies, then what would happen to the monsters? He adds that without the power supplies, the electric doors are useless. 
He says that if the release door is open, there will be a total of 15 monsters of rank 1 in the release zone within the upper levels. He says that apart from that, there will be 18 peak rank monsters from the experimental zone that he has not mentioned yet. He says they will all rush to the testing ground in no time, and participants will not even get time to use the emergency exit. The chief director says that all of them have already prepared their minds for death when they partake in the test. So it is normal for them to expect death in the test. He says to the director Chen that he cannot do that. He tells him that he will get the death sentence if he gets caught with this offense. The director asks why he cannot do that. He says they do not have any option but to complete the task. He adds they know what will happen to them if they fail to do the task assigned by the infamous fan family. He further says they cannot back out after receiving the money. The director says that he will make sure that he will not get the death sentence. The director says he will give him 10 million for the task and send him out of the if he wants to go. He then asks him if he is still interested in doing the task. Zaho says he will do it. The scene shifts to the testing ground and Zinkun punches the monster. Seeing this, Sheng says this is amazing and thinks about what he would go through to become this strong. Sheng tells Zinkun that he does not need to worry about the promise to go through with it. He says even if no one will pay, he will 50,000 from his pocket. No matter, even if he does not have it. Sheng cheers him with a bruised, swollen face. He says he and his sister will work off their butts to make that money. His sister shouts why he is involving her in this matter and punches him. He says to his sister that his neck is already half broken, and she has broken it completely now. His sister thanks Zinkun for saving their lives and says she is sorry they caused him the problem. Sheng says to Zinkun that they will supper together after that. He says he has already taken his food, so that is unnecessary. Zinkun tells them to watch out. A big monster appears behind them. Sheng, who was holding his sister and friend, had his back to the monster so he could not see it. When he sees the monster, he pushes his sister and friend to the sides. The monster crushes him under his heavy feet. His sister cries, seeing him dead under the feet of the monster. Wyan says what happened to the administration has not even half an hour passed, and they released the second round. Monsters attack them. Sheng's sister says they should have told them if they changed the test rules. Zinkun says they look like rank 2 monsters. The other participant says that it seems that all of them are released. Zinkun thinks it must be so to prevent him from passing the test. The boy calls out to Zayoto to get herself together. Zayoto cries badly seeing her brother dead. The boy tells Zayoto that Jiasheng is dead, and they will also be dead if they do not leave the place. Zayoto cries and says no, her brother is not dead yet. The boy says sorry to Zayoto and runs away. Zayoto sits helplessly toward her brother, who is still under the heavy foot of the monster. Seeing the monster, Wyan also runs. The monster holds Jiasheng by the foot and hangs him upside down. Zayotao punches the monster to free her brother, but she falls to the ground. The monsters gather around her and growl. Zayotao says sorry to her brother and says if they cannot live together, then they can at least die together. When the monsters are about to attack her, Zinkun drags her out of their reach and says if she is mad, and even if she wants to die, she should die with a good-looking guy. He adds her brother does not fit the bill. She cries and says she cannot let the monsters eat her brother. She runs toward her brother. He tells her to stay away for a while. He throws her towards Wyan and tells him to catch her. Hearing this, Wyan is he telling him to hold her. Zaiwadao falls over Wyan. They both fall to the ground. Zinkun thinks the monster will become rank 2 once they eat Sheng. He says, but to stop them, he has to mutate his left arm. He jumps at the monsters who are about to eat Sheng and asks him why they let him take Sheng. Seeing this, Zayoda wonders if he is going to fight three monsters to save her brother. Zinkun thinks the monsters will not see him as their enemy if he does not try to eat them. One of the monsters tries to put Sheng's foot in his mouth, but Zinkun does not let that happen. He punches the monster and says he will be thankful if he hands over his food to him. He frees Sheng from the hand of the monster. He throws Sheng away and attacks the monsters. He tells the monsters that they will no longer be hungry if they take one bite of him. Sheng wakes up and wonders if Zinkun saved him from the monsters. He sees Zinkun surrounded by the monsters. Sheng rolls on the floor because of pain. Zayotao rushes towards him. Zayotao tells her brother that he has saved both of them. Sheng tells his sister that it is a huge debt of favor and that she should pray for him. 
Xiaotao punches her brother. Jiaxing asks her if she wants to kill him. He tells his sister that they should quit and leave the testing ground. She says, but the ticket is on the ground. She adds she will try to get it once she takes him out of the testing ground. He says they should leave the testing ground as the situation is getting weird. She takes her brother out of the chamber. On the other hand, Zinkun says to the monster that they know that rank 1 monsters like them are his food for one day. He attacks them with his tentacle and says that happens only when he does not use his Lord Flames. He uses his Lord Flames and says that when he uses his Lord Flames, he can kill a monster like them every 10 seconds. Then he mutates his left arm and says the cost is quite high. He then says he needs to devour a hundred to evolve to the third rank. Then he thinks, why is it so difficult to evolve? He holds a big monster with his single hand. He sees that the releasing door is opening again. He thinks that it seems that they are advancing the test again. Jiaosheng says the risk rate is quite high this time. When he fails to open the exit door, he asks his sister if there is a blackout. Xiaoto diverts his attention towards the testing ground and tells him to see that there are so many monsters there. All the participants run after the ticket. One of them says that the ticket belongs to him. The other one says he wants a ticket to return to the institute because he wants power. One of them says he wants a ticket to get rich to kill the bastards who look down upon him. Meanwhile, a bulk of monsters surround and attack them. They wonder how so many of them gathered there. Another participant cries out that there should not be so many monsters. There must be something wrong. Monsters tear the participants into meat delicacy and everywhere there is blood on the testing ground. Zhao watches this from a height and says that he has destroyed electrical backup sources, so there is no turning back now. He says all they can do is to blame Zinkun. He thinks if he does not participate, he would not have risked his life to be sentenced to death for releasing all the monsters. He sees Zinkun smiling and says that he found him. He asks him why he is laughing. He says that he is in the safest place right now. Then he teases him and says he should be thankful because he earned 10 million because of him. He thinks after this task, he will leave this country tomorrow and live carefree for the rest of his life while all of them get eaten there. Zinkun swings a monster in the air and throws him onto Zhao. Zhao thinks that he missed the aim, so he laughs at him and calls him a piece of trash. Meanwhile, the monster pushes him from behind and throws him into the testing ground. He falls in the middle of the monsters and cries for help. He asks Zinkun for help and says he will give him some of his shares. Zinkun says he is sorry there are so many monsters that he cannot even save other participants, so how can he save him? He tells Zhao that he must have been lucky if he had not tossed a monster toward him, but he accidentally threw one on him. Zinkun smiles and says to Zhao that it looks like he will soon be turned into a sweet delicacy by the monsters. He cries for help, but soon monsters tear him into pieces. One of the monsters growls. He sniffs, looks at Zinkun and shouts traitor traitor. He says all traitors must be perish. Zinkun says that the rank 2 monsters are not dumb, so they identified him as having devoured his kind before. They all jump at him. He stands calmly and says to them, let's have a deal. Do not jump at me in a group. Seeing this chaos, the chief director says how he managed to kill the worker Zhao in this situation. He adds it looks like the task given by the fan family is not that easy to accomplish. Then he says he should put an end to things. He says the evolved monsters have already eaten more than 30 participants. He adds that not even a restored transcender will be able to make it out alive in this situation. He walks out and says that he needs to close the final door connecting to the second level. Will this everything will be over? Then he enters the control room, throws water on the boys who are dozing before the screen, and asks them what the hell has happened there. Is there a blackout? The boys wake up, and he asks them why there is a blackout in the testing ground, why the power sources have been cut, why all the exit doors cannot even be opened. The boys hold their heads and say it is not their mistake that worker Lai locked them up earlier, and he is the one who has destroyed all the main and backup power sources going out. The chief director shouts at them and says stop shifting the blame on someone else. It is their fault that they are slacking on the job. He commands them to restore the power immediately. Otherwise, all the blame and persecution will be useless. He adds how they get in if something wrong happens to the participants. The boy says restoring this will take at least half an hour. The chief director smiles after hearing this and tells them to do it in half an hour. The boy says God knows what worker Lai was up to. 
one says, what if Worker Lai has released some monsters into the testing ground? He says they should inform the headquarters of extermination departments to clear up the ground by force. The chief director says that in that case they need to pay 100 million, which they have to pay from their pocket. He adds what reason they will give them in dragging them into the matter. The boy says they can say that they suspected a technician pulling a prank and breaking some equipment there. The chief director says then what will they say the exterminators to destroy the main entrance of the building. He rebukes them, saying they should stop fooling around and restore the power supplies. The chief director thinks that by half an hour, all of them will be dead and only monsters will left. The scene shifts to the testing ground, which turns red with blood. All the doors are locked in the testing chamber. Zinkun uncovers his mutated arm and says that he is thankful for all the monsters. Now he can evolve without any worry. He tells the monsters to come and let him see them for the final time. He attacks them with his mutated arm and says that he will pray for them that they will not born with the monster genes in their next lives. He throws the flame of the Lord on them. Then he eats so many of them and says he has eaten so much. After eating them, he says that all the energy is more than he expected. He says this is because the monsters have already eaten so many participants with unawakened genes and he has indirectly consumed all of these descended genes. He says he cannot feel bad now, regardless that they all taste like human genes to him, and he can eat them even if they taste like shit. He says that he can enter in the hell to kill the king after gaining enough strength. He says who else will do that other than him. Meanwhile, a monster growls and calls him a traitor. He gives a shut-up call to him and says when he said comrades, he did not mean him. He was calling the real owner of the bodies. He says they are the enemies and parasites who have stolen the bodies of his comrades and calls them foreign intruders. He says he will soon kill them and their so-called king. He says his left arm is evolving again because he has consumed so much energy from the monster and transcended genes. He says from his experience evolving to the third rank involves the brain first. He says every single monster is connected to the internet, just like a phone that costs a hundred yuan to connect to the network, while being able to connect with all the hundred phones and also being able to search for phones that are worth connecting. He says he needs to cut that connection. He says if he can find them, they can also find him. He says he needs to sever it. He coughs and says it is getting late to cut that connection. The scene shifts to the survivors. All the participants try to get the ticket. Ziotal says to the other participants that Zinkun has saved her brother's life. So in that sense, he is her brother's big brother. If they are her brother in arms, they should not dare to take his belongings. The other participants say they join hands because they have common interests, so she should not dare to boss around like her big brother. He adds that she is only an idiot who a couple of talking can sway. One of the participants got angry and said this was their chance to get the ticket to continue their study in the institute, so let them do that. Jia Shang bleeds badly and says in the end, all they will be doing is to kill each other. Tian says he did not tell Zinkun to kill the monsters and get hurt. He says he got injured because he thought he could kill all the monsters alone. He says that if she wants to blame someone, she should blame him for trying to be a hero. Tian raises his finger toward Zinkun and tells him that if he does not want to die, he should hand over his ticket to him. He says to Zinkun that he must have taken the other two tickets as well, so it should be better for him to hand over all three tickets to him. Zinkun sits still, holding his left arm. Jiaoshen tries to stop Tian and says he will not let them hurt his savior. Jiaoshen tries to move close to them when Wine stops him and says that he should not move close to them, otherwise he will die. Jiaoshen asks him if he sent something. Tian tells Zinkun to hand over the ticket to him. Otherwise, he will snatch it by himself. He raises his hand over Zinkun. Meanwhile, an earth dragon appears out of the ground and in a flash of light turns Tian into a bloody blast. And almost everyone bleeds. Seeing this, one of the participants remembers that he heard about the earth dragon that a town in the south, along with the exterminator bureau, was annihilated by the earth dragon when the local four star transcenders were out of town. When the four star transcenders returned, they barely managed to drive the earth dragon away. One of the participants wondered why they even thought about the ticket while standing right below the head of the earth dragon. He badly bleeds from his eyes, nose and mouth. The earth dragon swallows. While dying, he murmurs that everyone is going to die. Zinkin thinks that he has attracted the attention of something formidable after getting connected to the network of monsters. 
Seeing this, he says taking their leaders down is a daunting task. The Earth Dragon strikes his tail to the wall and smashes it. Zinkun tries to stop him. But he feels that the change in his muscles is quite strong to manage. He feels that he cannot withstand it. So he thinks of figuring out a way to get a hold of it. Seeing this thing up close, he realizes that the Earth Dragon is a tentacle. The scene shifts to the Guardian waiting area, where parents are sitting and waiting for their children everywhere. Tian's mother prays to the Bachashatua to make his son clear that final try, if it happens, she will fast for a decade. Jiyu thinks that the lady does not know that the final trial has a mortality rate. Tian's father says to his mother that in his opinion, they should not have let him partake in the test. Why cannot he live a normal life where he will be safe? The mother replies that he should be ready to be killed peacefully as it is not the era it used to be before 20 years when the monsters were not around. She says one will be in danger nowadays if he does not have superpowers. She adds that to forget about job security and subsidies, the transcoders can better protect themselves and their families. Why does he think that all the people sitting are fools? Jiyu says that the testing ground is in front of them, and she can feel that the power level over there just went up. She says it is 10 minutes and the power has not returned, and this should not be part of the trial. He goes to the security guards and tells them that she is an upcoming institute student, and she can feel that something is abnormal inside the testing ground. People become anxious hearing this. The security guard wonders how she knows about that. They asked her what is she talking about. Everything was working normally, and they told her to go back to her seat. Otherwise, they would remove her forcefully from the waiting area. She tells them that electricity is her transcended power, and she can sense that something is wrong inside the testing area. They say from whom's behalf is she talking about as this place is only for the family members of the participants. They ask him who let her in. All the people in the waiting area put their hands on their hearts and say they feel like they are aching. The guards also sit on the floor. Jiyu wonders why all of them start feeling uneasy at the same time. She feels that something is wrong. She peeps inside and feels that there is a blackout inside. She enters the trial room. The guards try to stop her, but she enters anyway. Someone shouts hurry up, restore the power as the participants inside wait for them to open the door. They say that they have instructions from the chief director to open the gate of the first floor first as it is also stuck. The crew member in charge says that it is as if they are fixing the doors and that everyone can feel the overwhelming pleasure coming through the door. He thinks some terrifying monster must be out there, and they are a little bit safe with these doors as a barrier. He says the extermination department must have been notified of this much ruscus. He adds they need to take time to restore the power until the exterminators arrive. Jiyu asks him to let her handle this. He asks her who she is and who lets her in. He tells her to get out of the place immediately. She tells him that she is a freshman in the academy with 95% of transcended genes. She also tells him that she has an electricity attribute and she can restore the electricity. The man replies that she has not even entered the academy yet. He says that she does not count even if she is a freshman. He says that she has not even reached the first level of the transcended status, so there is no way she has that much power stored in her. So how can she even think that she can restore the power? He tells her to get the hell out of the place. She replies that he is right that she does not have that much electricity stored in her, but as long as she is in the city, she can have an unlimited supply of it. Soon visible electric particles appear around her. The crew present at the place wonders how did that happen. Their head tries to touch one of them and feels hurt. He thinks about how it is possible that the electricity is directly exposed out of her body and she cannot even feel it. That he thinks about the rumor about a prodigy with 95% genes. She emits electricity from both of her hands. He thinks she will restore the power in the faculty, and after that, she will try to open the door. Then he thinks he cannot let her do this. He adds even though he does not know what sort of monsters are out there in the testing ground, it still has to be dangerous. He says he is there to work, not to risk his life. He tells her that her power is unstable so that she will destroy the equipment. He adds all the equipment is government property, so she cannot let her recklessness destroy everything. She moves towards him and asks if he is going to stop her. He says that all he knows is that someone is hindering his work and trying to destroy the equipment. Ha calls out his team and commands them to remove her instantly. One of them gives her the gun and asks what she thinks they will spare her because she is a prodigy. They warn her not to dare to interfere in their work. They all stand in front of her and try to stop her. 
On the other hand, Zinkun fights with the Earth Dragon. He uses his Lord Flame to kill him and says it seems that his teeth are not even taking the effect of it. The monster attacks back and tears his left hand. He feels that his teeth are quite sharp and thinks what sort of teeth they are. He says they seem high in offense and defense at the same time. He says that the dragon does not even hit him once, and still he cannot devour any of his power. He says if this continued, his evolution to rank 3 will be halted. The dragon throws him away. He says that he needs to find a way to evade his teeth. He attacks the dragon with his tentacles and feels that his tentacles cannot even tear the dragon's skin. He hangs with the dragon with the help of his tentacles and says at least he can take hold of it. He then thinks about using his Lord Flame to scorn away his outer layer. He then tries to tear some of his flesh to consume. When he tries to do so, he realizes that the dragon can grow a black tooth on any part of his body. He attacks him with the maximum power output. On the other hand, the head of the crew thinks that she is the girl with the strongest history of transcended genes, which is why she attracted so much attention. Then he thinks she is still just a kid who has not yet entered the institute. He thinks the display of power would be enough for her because if he uses his power to harm her, the academy would blame him. He thinks using power is not an option in that situation. Meanwhile, one of the members of the crew fires a shot. The leader says that the security guards are idiots and they have no sense of control. She says this is bad and they will be held accountable. So moves back and misses the fire. She thinks that she is lucky that none of them harm her. Then she rethinks if it is just a matter of luck. She notices that the circulating electricity creates a magnetic field. She has created a strong electromagnetic field around her that secures her from all the bullets. The guards wonder if it is because of her 95% gene power. They say that she is anything but human. The leader wonders if the electricity can be used in this way like an extension of one of the body's limbs. Then he says that the most irrational part is how she manages to stand. He says who is she withstanding a terrible aura coming from the testing ground. Then he remembers that he has learned in the academy that people with extraordinary powers can withstand more pressure. With the help of the electromagnetic power, she pulls all the guns. She tells them that as all the power is restored, they should open the door now. The scene shifts to the second floor in the control room, where all three individuals, including the chief director, feel the same uneasiness and pain in their hearts as the people in the waiting area. The chief director holds his head and says something went wrong so restore the power quickly. The boy tells the director that the power has been restored. The chief director asks how that is possible when the repair has not even started their work on the second floor. How did they get the energy boost? He wonders if they fixed the wires on the first floor and connected wires on the second floor. He thinks their efficiency was not that high before. He thinks now the surveillance will be able to see if any monster will be open there in the testing ground. The boy says he will open the door to let everyone come out. The director thinks if he is mad, does he want to die? The boy presses the red button and opens the door. Standing in front of the gate, Jiu notices the gate opening. The chief director tries to go away. Jiu sees Zinkun with the Earth Dragon. Seeing the Earth Dragon, all the members of the teams get scared. They shout, asking what the hell is this. Jiu asks them if they have not read the newspaper and tells them it is an Earth Dragon. She calls out Zinkun, seeing him alone fighting with the dragon. Zinkun attacks the dragon again. Jiu emits electric rays from her eyes and another blackout happens. The chief director peeps through the gate to check what is going on. He asks himself why there is electricity flowing inside. The scene shifts to the headquarters. The crew over there notices that large amounts of electricity are shown to be surging along the wires with the testing ground and all the high voltage wires are already loaded. One of them thinks that this is probably the newcomer girl and says she might have lost control in the testing ground. She says however, considering the testing ground defense level does not allow, so it should not lead to widespread collapse. She asks herself if the available exterminators and four-star descenders are coming. The surveillance department station in Kingchu dispatched the team when they noticed an earthquake and an abnormal monster aura. Someone tells them to stay vigilant all the time. Jiu attacks the monster with electricity. Zinkun feels that and comes to know about her presence. He smiles and calls out what a great help. The black tooth thirsts in Zinkun's left hand. He thinks before anything he needs to take a bite of this thing. He takes a bite out of the dragon's body. The chief director sees this from the release gate. Zinkun sees Jiu fallen on the ground and rushes towards her. 
The chief director says that it seems that the task assigned by the fan family is not as straightforward as he thinks. He thinks that that person must have something hidden, but they all end here. He thinks that the appearance of the earth dragon is truly a stroke of luck for him. He says he should think about how to shift the blame, but then thinks this is unnecessary. He says that the earth dragon has removed all his evidence against Zinkun for him. Zinkun holds Jiyu. The earth dragon attacks them. The chief director thinks that the scene is already chaotic and the exterminator department will still take a few minutes to reach, and in that time frame, no one will get to know about what he did. The chief director calls out all the staff of the testing ground and asks all the individuals with the transcended power to gather quickly. He commands them to stop the earth dragon till the extermination department reaches. He tells them that under no circumstances should any individual get hurt out there. He says this will also give the remaining students a chance of survival. He also sends the boys who are present with him in the office. Then he says that now no one can stop him. Zinkun says that the Earth Dragon had blocked everyone's view from here and now he should wait for some time. His left arm burns like a red fire. He says the third level of evolution is becoming difficult and it is difficult for him to maintain his human appearance. Meanwhile, the chief director arrives there and attacks Zinkun with fire. However, he manages to get hold of it. Soon, the chief director sees Zinkun mutating into a monster and says what the hell is he? He wonders what sort of transcended abilities will even allow this sort of transformation. He sweats and says the boy possesses five major powers, water, metal, fire, wood and earth. He thinks special evolutions, ice, winds, lightning and mental transactions none of the transcended powers from the attributes would allow transformation only for one arm. He asks him if he is a transgender for real. Then he says he does not care who he is. He attacks him with pointed metal rods and tells him to die. Zinkun tries to save himself with the help of his left mutated arm and countless pointed metal rods thrust into his arm. The chief director wonders and thinks that this arm is not like a human arm but a monster's arm that these metal rods pierced through. Then he wonders what are these flames that even melted his metal rods. He says all monsters do not possess all of these attributes, then he thinks he is a fire-based transcender. Then he remembers something and sweats badly. He says there is one possibility when a monster possesses all of these abilities, which is if he is a monster of rank 4 or above. Zinkun attacks him with his mutated arm. The director wonders and asks him what he is, and he says that he does not look like a human or a monster. Xenjikun throws flames at him. Then, the director thinks that though he is unable to kill him quickly, he is a monster through and through in appearance. He says he only needs to wait for some time. When the exterminators arrive, they will kill him. In the middle of his evolution, Zinkun thinks that it seems quite difficult to evolve into the third level. He says it must be because he ate the part of the Earth Dragon just now. Then he feels the same power as the Black Tooth. He thinks that if he never tames it now, then he will not be able to return to his human form. He holds his mutated arm. The chief director forms a golden shield and says that the monster is quite formidable, but when it comes to defense, his golden shield is not that vulnerable either. The golden shield broke down, and drops of blood fell on the white coat of the chief director. The director notices that the golden shield broke because of the black spikes on the boy's arm. The director tries to get a hold of himself as blood drips out of his body. He thinks about what sort of monster he is. He realizes that his shield cannot hold the black spikes. He clenches his teeth and says now he cannot stay here for a moment or else he will die. He tells Zinkun that his sincere advice is that he should stay there with that appearance or else people will hunt him down. He adds the exterminators will kill him when they arrive. He says that even if he is lucky with them, he is still a monster, an enemy of the human race, and no one will help him. He tells him any human out there will be pleased to kill a monster like him as all the monsters must be eliminated. When the director tries to run away, Jiyu stops him and attacks him with her electric power. The director asks her if she is on his side and tells her to see him closely. He is a monster. She strikes him badly and says he is not a monster. He is Zinkun. The director says she knows what she is doing. She throws him away. The director says she is betraying her species and will regret this. Zinkun raises his mighty mutated hand in the air, strikes the ground, and says that if the world would not tolerate the existence of the monsters, then he will crave a path by himself. He says to the director that he is going to be devoured. He then absorbs his powers. 
Ji Yu tells him that the exterminators have arrived. Xin Kun tells her to maintain distance from him and pretend that she does not know him because he does not know whether he will manage to revert to his human state or not. However, she comes forward and holds his arm. He says she will stay by his side even if he goes to hell. He says that in the end, it is still her Ji Yu. The voices arrive, saying that they get in quickly and try to save the remaining students. Is Zinkun going to be exposed? The head of the crew instructs the Transcenders to use the three-star Earth attribute as a shield to buy some time. The Transcenders say they must protect the outsider from the Earth Dragon just as the directors ordered them. They say they must not retreat. The crew leader thinks that he will escape when the shield is destroyed. The Earth Dragon strikes him and turns him into pieces. One of the members says that the shield cannot withstand a single blow. The other one says that there is no way that they can stand against him and says that even the director has disappeared. Some of the guards try to kill him with their guns. Two of them say they need to get out of the place. Meanwhile, the earth dragon again attacks them. They feel severe pain in their hearts and say that they will not survive. They say that they cannot even run away. Soon, the exterminators enter, holding their pipes, which are their specialty. A female exterminator throws a pipe at the Earth Dragon and says that he is the one who destroyed her blind date. One of the crew members says that she is planning to kill all of us. They feel that the water blade goes through them. The water blade manages to sever the Earth Dragon. Seeing this, the crew says that they tried so many things but failed to do any damage to the Earth Dragon. But the water blade that dances like spites rages like devils. One of them says that this is the thing that is halting their progress towards four-star transcenders. He says, is she the legendary emblem of the transcenders? The four-star transcender tells them to move away as the earth dragon recovers. They call Shang Guangqiu the strongest four-star transcender of the institute with 95% transcended genes. She tells them to leave the dragon to her and evacuate the people who are outside. She also tells them to convey the inside details to the coming exterminator's faculty and leave the survivor's rescue mission to them. The scene shifts to the testing ground, Jiyu asks Zinkun if he can revert his arm to the normal. She says if he cannot do that, he should hide, and she can buy him some time. Zinkun rushes towards a chamber, and Jiyu runs towards the gate. She tells the exterminators that they have done an awesome job, and that she is fine now. She also directs to the other direction and says she has heard some panting voices from there. Zinkun tries to revert to the normal human state. He says that the power of the third rank is way too strong for rank 2. He says that the main reason is the size of the third rank monster, and that it is exceptionally difficult to accommodate the third rank monster. He says he needs to continue compressing his power to revert to the human state. He thinks that he should first evolve his bones strong. He says he received the 1% transcended genes on the first day of his reincarnation. He thinks they are absorbing the, the transcended genes he just devoured from the fat gay. This must be because both of them are metals. Instead of that one present transcended gene that has been awakened, he should try to stabilize the monster genes with the help of those transcended genes, and then he should direct them in a controlled manner. He first evolves his bones. Then he tackles the earth dragon tooth. On the other hand, the exterminators thank Ji Yu and say it is because of her help that they managed to save three participants. One of them asks her what it is. Is it a monster? Ji Yu thinks Xin Kun is going to be exposed. She is about to say something. They hushed and said that any sound will attract the monster's attention. She thinks if Xin Kun is forced out of society, she will accompany him no matter where he goes. When they move towards the chamber, Xin Kun tells them he has just recovered after being knocked out. They say he has scared them. The exterminator informs his captain that they have found five survivors. Jiu asks Zinkun if he is all right. He replies just like new, but he still cannot be compared to the real deal. He says the control is still quite weak. The exterminator says that it is good to hear that the earth dragon has retreated and they are going to take the survivors out of the testing ground. Shang Guangqiu says that the humans are quite weak, and they do not know that only a four-star transcender can deal with an earth dragon. The earth dragon is a small piece of the body of the demon god. The monsters hidden deep in the earth are beyond what humans can comprehend. Zinkun says he needs to get more power as soon as he can. He adds he needs to save himself before saving others. He says he needs power and resources so that he and Jiyu will be invisible to the world first. Then he says that he needs to hide from the transcenders even before. Zenkun says to Jiyu that there is only one year left before the chaotic transformation of the world. 
Jiyu deeply thinks about something. He tells her to wake up and asks her how long she is going to think while sitting. There is not much time left for them. He tells her she has been staring at the people since she foots in the school. She says that what he means is that she has been doing that for the last 365 days. He says he does not mean that. What he means is they are left with little time. He tells her the world that they can see will undergo a tremendous change after a year from now. He tells her she needs to evolve to the fourth grade transcender as soon as possible. He adds the earlier the better. The newcomers enter the institute in bulk with their suitcases. She says as far as they know, the principal fourth grade transcender is the strongest rank. She looks at him while sitting on the suitcase and says they do not even know how strong the rank 5 is. He tells her they need to work much harder than the college entrance examination. She looks at him with worry. He tells her not to worry he will help her with that. She says that she trusts him with everything, except when he says he has pretended for his promiscuous ways. He says, first of all, she needs to evolve into a three-star transcender within a month. She says she currently has 95% transcended genes in her. He tells her that the more transcended genes one has, the more resources one requires during the early stages. He says that, but where do they find resources when they do not have a strong background? She looks back at Jia Sheng, Wyan and Xiaodo and asks him if they are resources. Jia Sheng waves toward them. He says that it is only because of his aid that Wine, Zhao Sheng, Zhao Ziaotao, and he managed to survive the final trial and the chance to study at the institute. The school had made an exception and rewarded everyone who survived as if he passed the trial itself. He says they owe him a great deal of gratitude. He says from now on, he is their leader, and they are his service until death does them apart. He bows before him and makes Wine and Ziaotao bow forcefully. Ziaotao says this is quite embarrassing. She says he has found a devoted man now and says that he has truly evolved. He says he already repented and changed his ways. Jiao Sheng asks him if he knows who she is. He says that he has wanted to ask this ever since, but he has not gotten a chance to ask during the final test. He tells them that her name is Jiu. She says hello to them. All three of them are shocked hearing her name. They ask him if she is the one from the forum with the strongest freshman in their academy has ever seen since its inception. A transgender with 95% of genes, the highest amount in history, named Jiyu. Zinkun says that they are overreacting. Jia Sheng asks him if they are both in a relationship. Zinkun says that explaining things is always a hassle. Both of them are shocked to hear that. Zinkun says it's not happening. They are not a couple. He and this little brat are just childhood friends. Jia Sheng says they will not believe it, even though they share the same luggage. Wine says that since they are childhood friends, they must have formed a team together. Then he says that he has a suggestion. The institute conducts a competition for each new batch of students after they have successfully enrolled. Each new student will be given a set of resources, and they will compete with each other using their abilities. So how about if they form a team temporarily? He says his spiritual sense will help them avoid the new student's top talent. Then, they might avoid their resources being taken away by others, and they may even be able to take resources from one or two classmates. Jia Sheng tells him to shut up and asks if he is trying to harm his big brother. He replies no, he is just giving a suggestion. Jia Sheng says that the students who are currently on the constitution list, as well as those who are low in genes, are always more likely to be targeted, especially in this generation. He asks if their classmates had not told them about that before the prodigy, who was tested to have 88% transcended genes during high school graduation, is the leader of the newcomers already. They say they aim to steal all of the resources from those with less than 50% of transcended genes. It is hard for those with less than 50% of their genes to become awakened. He tells them that he has 39% genes, Ziotao has 41%, and Wyan has 50% transcended genes. He says to Zinkun that they will not become a burden on him. Zinkun and Jiyu look toward each other. They think about stealing the resources. Zinkun asks if it is not their first batch of resources coming in. Jiyu says they are coming with little cuties. She says as long as they nurture them into capable assistants, it will save a lot of their efforts. Zinkun says that he will become them becoming the powerhouse, second only to them, if not in the world, then at least in the school. That way, they can also reach the pinnacle of their lives and be ready to remove all the obstacles. Jiu punches Zinkun lightly and says it is not binding them in the chain of friendship. Zinkun asks them to be a team together. 
Both Wyan and Jia Sheng become shocked upon hearing this. Then Jia Sheng tells him that he should not take pity on them. Xin Kun says this is not for any other reason but because they are loyal. He taps his shoulder and says they are all top-notch and reliable partners. Jia Sheng cries upon hearing this. Xin Kun adds that because they are joining the team, the goals are a little bit different. Jia Sheng says that since his big brother has such high expectations of them, they must not let him down. He says that they will follow his lead in everything. Xin Kun says that he suddenly thought of the possibility of someone accidentally obtaining all the resources from everyone. Ji Yu adds that those resources would not belong only to them. Wine is shocked and thinks that probably does not sound right. Xin Kun taps Jia Sheng's shoulder and says they should not be worried. They are just curious and tell them to go to the dorm and get their luggage settled there. Ji Yu tells them they will have their first class tonight. Jia Sheng says okay. Wine says he always wanted to ask him what percentage of descended genes he has. Xin Kun replies that he will soon get to know about it. He adds that might surprise him. Jia Sheng tells him that Big Brother's gene percentage must be very high. The scene shifts to a lecture room. The teacher tells the students that he is Bo Yang, and he will be their foundational teacher for the year. He says to be very clear if they cannot awaken their powers within a year, then get out of the Transcendence Institute. He says those back from the final trial, like Wyan with 50% genes who have awakened his mental attributes danger perceivance, will match for his weak asked 50% genes. The teacher asks about 40% and 39%. Jia Sheng raises his hand and says that he is there. Xiao Tao slowly says that she is present. The teacher raises his finger toward them and says if they cannot awaken their abilities within this year, then they get out of the institute and live like ordinary people for the rest of their lives. Jia Sheng replies that he will do his best this year. Xin Kun asks him what is up with this teacher brother. He tells him that as long as one does not awaken one's powers and his gene percentage is below 50%, he would call that student with his percentage. The teacher settles his spectacles, tells them their generation is quite special, and confirms that they must have seen some of the reports. He looks towards Ji Yu and tells the students that the human with the highest percentage of genes in the human is among them. He adds that her future is unimaginable for them, including him as a teacher. He says, but what is surprising for him is that someone in the class has 1% of transcended genes. He frowned and said the student with 1% of genes who is no different than a normal human being, please stand up and let everyone get to know him. Hearing this, Shizai Fan smiles. Students wonder if that is not that quite low to be there. Zhe Sheng thinks that the guy with 1% genes is bound to be targeted by everyone. Xin Kun stands up and tells the teacher that he has already awakened and his power has transcended the power of the metal element. Jia Sheng gets shocked and says, is that him? The teacher wonders and thinks a person with only 1% of genes can also awaken. He sets his glasses and asks Xin Kun to assist him on the stage. Xin Kun puts his hands in his pockets and says there must be a reward for assisting in teaching. The teacher replies that he will receive an extra share of resources in the post-class resources competition. He says to the teacher that he is grateful for that. The teacher says that he should not thank him yet as a student with 1% genes and two shares of resources will soon become a nightmare. Xin Kun comes on the stage and tells the students that transcended powers refer to elemental abilities such as metal, wood, water, fire, earth, ice, wind, lightning, mental and more. He adds that as long as one awakens, he can harness the power of these elements through his transcended genes. One of the students says that as far as he knows, these elements can temporarily reside in the transcended genes. The teacher says that at this point, one needs to control extraordinary genes and should store elements that are external to the body. The teacher adds that when one prevents the elements from dissipating and molds the transcended genes into a perfect battery, he successfully becomes a one-star transgender. Then he adds that they first need a piece of metal for demonstration. He holds a metal rod and says the elements that transcended genes can accommodate are limited. He tears a small piece of metal from the rod, gives it to Xin Kun, and says that if he has 1% transcended genes, then that much should be enough for him. He says this means he can only deal with this small piece of metal in this life. He says he can play with it for a while. Xin Kun thinks that transcended elemental power is all so strange yet familiar. He thinks that there are the powers that the highest level monsters acquire after a while. He looks at the piece of metal and thinks that the peak of monster evolution is to become transgender. 
The teacher adds that each person has a mysterious chain of genes. Whether one becomes a monster or a transgender depends on whether this genetic chain mutates into a monster or a transcended genetic chain. He says, fortunately, all of them are transcended beings with their mysterious genetic chain evolved into transcended genetic chain. He says the content of these transcended genes within their transcended genetic chain determines one future achievement. He adds that the more transcended genes one possesses, the more sensitive one's perception abilities will become. Thus, it makes it easier for him to cultivate. Sir Bolyang says there is not even a bit of fairness in that, but this is how the world works. He adds that starting at 90% of genes, every additional 1% brings significant enhancement. He says, for instance, that Shang Guangqiui can breathe underwater with the help of her 91% transcended genes. Ji Yu can stand at least 3,000 volts of electricity without any problem. He says if a 100% transcended genes carrier will appear, he might be called God instead. He adds that the lower one's percentage of the transcended genes, the lower his sensitivity to elements would be and it becomes harder for that person to cultivate. He says there were no records of people with below 20% transcended genes before Zinkun. Zinkun says to Bo Liang if he means this. Bo Lian looks at him and asks if he needs help. Zinkun says he can easily take the piece in and out of his body without any problem. Bo Liang wonders how proficiently he can do that. He thinks that his awakening is not an accidental miracle. He says to Zinkun that it seems he either has the wisdom that is one in a million or a once in a lifetime stroke of luck. Zinkun thinks that if he unleashes the metal again, the teacher will teach him another truth. He says the difference between 1% and 80% is that it is like 80 persons ganging in one. He thinks there is no need for tactical formation. Having a crowd of transcended individuals is already an overwhelming advantage. Bo Liang says that his power will be easily crushed. He says that people with fewer transcended genes should always be aware that they are weaker. He says that the weak one should hide behind the strong one. Zinkun reflects and says that the last time teacher Bo Liang was killed by his hands, when he was buying some time for his students to escape. Then he says that teacher Bo is a great teacher. Zinkun observes Bo Liang sweating profusely. He thinks the teacher is trying to pressure him to submit to his transcended genes. He says his transcended genes have devoured the fat man, and his genes have also turned fatty. He says that he should pose a little bit more low-key. Otherwise, what would he do if other students come and bully him? He then jumps back and says he cannot hold any longer. After doing that, he thinks that acting is very exaggerated. Bo Liang notices that he lost him on purpose and says he cannot pressure him. The students cheer that the teacher has done an awesome job. The teacher says of course, what was that 1% carrier thinking anyway? While deep down he thinks he is almost about to lose his reputation. He says this kid has secrets and knows what he is doing. Zinkun says that he is thankful for the demonstration. Bo Yang replies that it is all for the first day of the foundational lesson. He adds that the survival of the fittest, the winner takes all, is their school's philosophy. Bo Yang asked the students if they were ready for the resources competition. The students replied that they had been ready for a while. One of them says that he does not know if the Zinkun guy is ready for the competition, since he happened to hear his boastful words when he came to school today. He adds that he wonders where that 1% transcended gene carrier got this confidence. He laughs and says he wants to knock down all of them and seize their resources. He says he is quite audacious. He tells Zinkun that he wants to get everyone's resources, which is very audacious. He adds however, that the surprising part is how he managed to awaken his 1% transcended genes. He says it looks like he has put in tremendous effort. He says his name is Yuxing, he has 85% transcended genes and is a water attribute transcender. He says that he admires his perseverance for trying while carrying inferior genes and being able to awaken his attributes. He says he will make an exception by inviting him to join his team. He tells him they are gathering students above 60% and forming a strong alliance. Then he thinks that as long as he joins their team, his girlfriend Ji Yu, with 95% transcended genes, will also join them. He says that together, they will fulfill his insane plan and seize the other students' resources. He brings his hands towards him and invites him to get all the resources to make the best of them instead of wasting them. Zinkun rejects his invitation and says that at the end, he will be bullying the weak ones. Yuxin gets angry and asks what the hell he thinks himself. 
he says to Zincon that he is just trash with 1% genes and does not even have the qualifications to get into this institute. He adds that he has passed the final trial because GU saved him. He adds that he does not think that he does not have this information long ago. He says he invited him solely because he was expecting GU to join their team. Zinkun makes a face and says ops, he has hit a sore spot. Yuxing tells Zinkun to wait and adds that his team will seize the resources from all the weaklings. Zinkun gives him a thumbs up and says he will pray for him. Bo Liang asks him if he purposely triggered that boy. He replies that son he was encouraging him. Bo Liang says to begin the resources competition. He then tells everyone to come and take their resource exchange token and gather in the forest for further instructions. He takes his hand towards Zinkun and says those two tokens are for him. The scene shifts to the forest. The students get the instructions that they should not leave the forest, they have one hour to do whatever they want to, and from now onwards everything depends on their abilities. The competition begins. Zheosheng says to Wyan and Xiaotao to go to Big Brother Zinkun. Wyan stops and says that he still needs to think about himself. Zheosheng asks him what does he mean by that. He tells him that the other team said that even though he has 49% transcended genes they are ready to make an exception and add him to their group. Zheosheng tells him that Big Brother will take them further in life. Wyan says he is sorry. Although Zinkun is strong, he is still at 1%, and in addition, he has already provoked the alliance right from the beginning. Zheosheng calls Wyan a traitor. However, Xiaodao calms him down and says that he should not force him everyone has his ambition. One of the boys from Alliance says that being watched by ten powerhouses, it is no wonder that he walked out. Then he calls Zinkun 1% and says that he can laugh for now, but from now on, he will have a close eye on him, and he will not be able to hide anywhere. He says that soon big brother Chengping will come, and then it will be his turn to cry. Zinkun smiles to tease him and says all right after all bullying the weak ones does not take much time. The boy gets mad and asks him what he means by that. Then he says if one knows something about the resources, this is called efficiency. A girl runs into the jungle, stops and thinks that she has run enough not to get caught by anyone. Yuxing appears behind her and says that no one can escape from him as 70% of the human body consists of water. He tells the girl to hand over her resources token to him, and he will make things less painful for her. The girl says that the resources belong to her, so why should she give them to him? He says she should rather blame her weak genes for not being strong enough. He then forcefully tries to take the tokens from her and moves toward the others. Two boys from the alliance catch another girl and say that now she cannot run anywhere. Meanwhile, two boys from the same team beat and boy and demanded a token from him. Fan Shizai meets Yu Qing in the jungle and asks him if he already has all the resources that he thinks he deserves. He replies that he has not come to meet him but still, it is good that he has come to him. He says to Fan Shizai that let him test whether the young master of the Fan family, who has not undergone a genetic test and enrolled in the school through a back door, can join their alliance or not. He replies that he has the same thoughts. He then says that let him test whether he has the qualifications to be his underling. Yuxian gets mad at the word underling and asks if he is in the habit of being a master everywhere. He adds that how dare he think he can wave his fan family position everywhere. He then throws water on the fire created by fan Shizai and says that is not water supposed to counter fire. He says even if the fire is strong, his black marsh cannot evaporate soon. The weaker ones call alliance scoundrels and ask them to return their resources. They say that they will fix them once they get strong. On the contrary, alliance boys say that finally, they have harvested all the resources. They call the weak ones stupid and ask who will wait for them to get strong. One of the boys says that it is a dog-eat-dog -dog world, if someone cannot accept it, then he should get stronger. The boy from the alliance team says that he is just waiting for Zinkun to come so that he can collect the remaining tokens from him. He says the 1% is scared now. He says if it were not for Jiyu, he must have electricity. He says that the girl with 95% girl must have done something. He says he needs to find Jiyu. He jumps at Jiyu and attacks her. Zinkun holds his hand and asks Jiyu how much time she needs to prepare. She says she needs just one minute. The boy thinks that if his hand is made out of metal, he cannot move even a bit of it. He thinks about what she means in one minute. Seeing in a blackout, Bo Liang says that it looks like the Institute's electricity bill will exceed significantly this semester. 
He then says that the finance department should be worried about that. Zinkun says that since they have already been exposed, they should not try to hide anymore. He tells her to get ready to electrocute them. The boy calls out his fellow to stop her when she attacks him with her electricity. He tells them that she is going to electrocute them to death. He asks his fellow what they are waiting for and tells them to attack the 1% first. Zinkun asks Jiyu why she is not releasing it. She tells him there is still one person he cannot find. Zinkun simultaneously holds the two boys' hands. The boys feel that their bones are breaking. They wonder how he is so strong. The rest of the group members plan to attack him. One of the boys tells them to be careful. He says that those who already awaken their powers should attack him. She tells him she cannot find the boy Yuxing, but there is no need to worry as she has already thrown electricity in the wind. He tells him that she found him to be someone with fire attributes and is fighting with someone with water attributes. Zinkun says that individuals with less than 60% transcended genes need not get angry. He will help them avenge. He tells them that he will take up all the stolen tokens from their hands and then their starting points will become the same as before and they can still work harder for the next time. Zinkun knocked down all the members of the alliance group. Zinkun prevents the other participants from running and tells them they already have Jiyu's signature static electricity on their bodies, so they will be electrocuted at the end. Then he says that Jiyu told him she had developed it during the previous timeline. Jiyu called a targeted thunder strike and threw electricity in the air. The scene shifts to Yuxiang and Fan Shizai. Yuxiang tells Fan Shizai that he cannot beat him with these flames. Fan Shizai says that he should try the flame palm. He holds him with a big flame hand. Yuxiang says he got grabbed and cannot wiggle his way out with his water elemental powers. Fan Shizai closes his fist tightly and asks Yuxiang what he feels about that. Yuxiang replies that he cannot do anything about that because this is not fire. Fan Shizai says good, he has passed the test. He adds that he and his alliance qualified to come under him. He removes the flame palm from him. Exhausted, Yuxing asks what he means about qualifying when he has not even fought. He tells him that he has already reached the three-star transcended status and can easily graduate from the institute. He adds that the fact that he survived his flame palm without getting disfigured is quite good. He asks him why he is here if he already reached the status of a three-star transgender person. He tells him that these resources are already in his grip for what they are all fighting. He says he is here to help the Fan family recruit young talent here. He tells him he assures him that the Fan family will treat every outstanding talent according to individual capabilities. He says they will enable their quick growth. He takes his hand toward him and says that this fairness is not easy in this world. So, is he ready to accept it? Yuxing holds his hand and says that he accepts that. Soon Jiyu's electric powers reach Yuxing. He falls to the ground and says that he cannot move. Fan Shizai identifies Jiyu's powers. Zinkun commands Zhao Shang and Zio Tao to go and get the resource tokens from them and assures them they should not worry about them. They are unable to move for the next half hour. Zinkun waves to Fan Shizai and says oh he is not easy to disarm as easily as expected. Yuxing says that the electricity is quite strong. Fan Shizai calls out Jiyu. She says he needs not ask again. She will not join his team. Fan Shizai says that he is not going to say this. He then attacks them with the flame palm. He tells Jiyu that he respects her decision and will wait until she makes the right decision. Zinkun takes Jiyu behind him and says she should rest for a while as he is not the opponent she can fight. He moves forward and says that he wants to test his transcendent power. There appears a thunder of fire. Zinkun moves close to Fan Shizai and asks him why he is nervous. Is it because no one ever came so close to him before that? Fan Shizai calls him an arrogant fool and attacks back. Zinkun says that, as expected of someone who possesses 90% of transcended genes, he can create two massive and energy-consuming flames. When Shizai attacks with a flame palm, he attacks him with a piece of metal. Fan Shizai makes two flame palms around him and says he cannot run anywhere. He then brings his hands together and merges two flame palms to grab Zinkun. Yuxing says that this is his true power, but he is killing him by doing this. He replies that he will not be killed with this. After all, he has survived the final trial. Zinkun flies out of the grip of two fire palms. Yuxing wonders how he managed to get out of the grip of the fire palms while he was stuck. He was unable to get out. Fab Shizai scatters a thousand flame palms in the air around Zinkun. Zinkun says oh, there are more of them now, 
but they are smaller ones. He slashes a golden blade in return. Fan Shizai thinks that it seems like he is quite familiar with real-life combats and it does not look like he has just awakened. He adds just what the hell is he? He feels that the golden blade he is controlling is sharp. When he finds it difficult to knock him down, he says that using fatalities at the school is not a good idea. Jiyu says he is saying so because he is avoiding getting injured. He knows that one wrong move will cause him to face irreparable damage. Two transcended powers clash with each other. Fan Shizai decides to use his 90% powers against his 1% and overpower him. He says that he will destroy his transcended power, and once his transcended genes ruptured, it will take at least a year to recover. And this way, he will no longer be a thorn in his way. He feels that Zinkun's transcended genes are unbelievably strong when he tries that. He says that who would believe that he resembles his four-star ranked uncle. Zinkun pretends to fall and says that Fan Shizai is so strong. Fan Shizai thinks that what the hell is he doing? Zinkun says to Fan Shizai that he concedes that he is the strongest one in this generation. He says he feels like he cannot continue it any further. Bo Liang announces the end of the competition. He says that he hopes that they must have gained something different. He asks them to hand over the tokens to him, and he will ask the resources department to allocate the resources to them. Everyone looks down out of shame. Zinkun tells Bo Liang that they accidentally got a hold of all the tokens. They are a total of 87. Would he like to count them? Bo Liang says that is quite audacious of them. They must have become the official target of many. Zinkun says that he assures him that he will work harmoniously with his classmates. Bo Liang asks if the one token is still left with Fan Shizai. Fan Shizai checks his token. Zinkun says that when Fan Shizai defeated him, he found a resource exchange token on the ground and took it. He says he is sorry and asks Shizai if he wants his token back. Fan Shizai says no thanks he can take it. Then he thinks that he will get Zinkun next time. The scene shifts to the resource department. The resource department tells them they will give that sucks portions of these. Jia Sheng says that six portions total 42 vital life essence fluids, an unimaginably precious treasure trove for them. They will cherish them and strive to awaken. They move out of the resource department and carry the resources on the trolley. Zioto says she wants to ask something. Jia Sheng asks her to call him Big Brother. She asks Zinkun if he could have defeated Fan Shizai and why he did not. He replies that he is the young master of a formidable fan family. They had already received all the resources they wanted, so there was no need to rush into him so soon. Jia Sheng says that Big Brother is amazing. They reach the dorm. Xin Kun moves forward. Jia Sheng tells him that he is going the wrong way. He says there are women's dormitories, and he has the same room. He tells him there are specially built rooms for those with a high percentage of transcended genes to prevent them from accidentally harming their classmates, and he is going to them. He replies that, but that is Jiyu's room. Zaiwata says to Jia Sheng that he is too slow. He says that, oh, he will stay with his big sister. The wife or girlfriend of a big brother is called a big sister. They say goodbye to each other and leave. Zinkun says he has already told them they are just childhood friends. He tells Jiyu that teaching her how to absorb the resources quickly will take the whole night. He laughs and says it seems like he has not spent a whole night in the same room since high school. Jiyu calls him a womanizer and says that his relationships were quite chaotic after high school. Who would like to spend a night with him? He says he turns over a new leaf, so she should be quiet. Jiyu thinks that the boy has turned quite different. The scene shifts to Jiyu's room. Zinkun tells Jiyu that as a larger number of transcenders started to appear in the world, humans began to study their powers and try to replicate them. He adds that because humans cannot recreate their powers artificially, they can use biological sources such as animals and extract a substance called life essence. He tells her that the liquid allows the consumption of elemental powers in superhumans. He pours a bottle of life essence into his mouth and says it is like a man-eating monster. He says eating them is useless as it does not satisfy one's hunger. He says that the resource department told him that consuming one drink in a day is better as it aligns with the body's natural absorption and repair rate and thus offers the best usage. Then he puts his hand on the ground and says she should not worry. He says she does not need to worry about the school's electricity bill. He tells her to advance to the rank one as quickly as possible. Zinkun proceeds toward her and asks her to give him a jolt. He comes close to her and says let him see if she left any electricity in her body. Jiyu feels awkward. 
Many thoughts pop out in her brain about how she thought he no longer looked out for girls and has changed. She thinks this might be because he has found a target close to him. He asks her again to jolt him. He pulls his cheeks and says that she is usually so violent, so she cannot say that she is unable to do that. He comes even more close to her. She asks him what he is doing. He bends down on her. She thinks about what the hell he is up to and says that that is why he stops looking out for other girls. She asks Zinkon to wake up and tells him how she is feeling. He tells her that she smells too good and that he wants to eat her. He evolute into a monster partially and repeats that he wants to eat her. She pushes him back and says how dare he try to eat her. She gives him a jolt and says that she will send him to the hell. Seeing electricity coming out of Zhiyu's room, Zayoto says that it seems quite important to give highly transcended people separate rooms. Zinkon holds his face, says that her highly transcended genes are overwhelming, and tells her that she smells deadly tempting for a mutant like him. He takes off his jacket and says that he can sense that she has evolved to the rank one. He tells her that he will soon be back. Jiyu throws a mask onto him and says that wearing a mask is necessary while doing something bad. He takes the mask. She tells him to take care. He says he is going out for some snacks and tells her he will bring some supper for her. He tells her he is a new rank 3 monster and can take a full rank 3 monster while using Lord Flames. He says that as long as he manages to hide his mutated hand, the people will think he is fire elemental. As he walks in the jungle, he feels something and says he must hide his flames. He runs quickly to hide. His heart throbs and he detects the presence of the earth dragon. He says it is the same one he met on the testing ground. He says even though he has come this far from the Transcendence Institution, the school is not still far enough from the testing ground. The Earth Dragon is still looking for him in this area. He says that the Earth Dragon can sense him, and if he uses his Lord's Flames, then things will knock on his door. He says it looks like today's supper will not be tasty. He says there are not just three underground Earth Dragons, but many mysterious monsters that humans have not yet discovered. He adds that humans do not know monsters who were once humans are still alive. The death of these monsters will release their genetic energy in the form of smoke, which will flow continuously into the bodies of these underground monsters. After one year, when these monsters accumulate enough power, it will trigger the apocalypse. He says he happened to stumble upon a clue about one of these underground monsters in his previous life. The scene shifts to a car where a boy cries that his head is hurting, and he tries to find out where he is. He says he remembers that he had finished his session with a fellow member of the Redemption Association to release some stress. A masked boy drives the car, and a few people tied in the ropes sit in the backside of the car. The masked boy asks his partner Falcon if he has used less medicine. It seems like he did not use the right dosage amount. The boy says that he wants to go home, but what they are doing is illegal. Falcon says that he has used the right amount, but it seems that the boy is different from the rest. He says that it looks like they got a big one this time. He says that he has more minster genes, so he woke up earlier. According to his estimation, he asks how valuable he is compared to the rest of the stock. He says that he wakes up three hours earlier than the estimation, so he must have more than 8% genes. The boy cries badly. Falcon says he is the greatest stock with times the amount of life essence compared to a grade D, so that is a great profit. He says it would be a big problem if he turned into a monster, so please shut him down. Zinkun rolls in the air and hits the car. Zinkun's punch made a huge dent on the bonnet of the car and it jumped up for a while. The masked boys wonder who the hell is he who did that. They say the engine has busted. One of them tells the other one to keep an eye on the guys and not transform them prematurely into monsters. He is going after that gay. Meanwhile, Zinkun appears behind him. Before his fellow tells him about that, Zinkun breaks the window glass and holds him by his neck. He drags the boy out of the car and throws him away. One of the boys asks him if the information got leaked out. The other one asks who the hell he is. He adds he does not know whether he knows something or not. He does not want him to go alive. The boy in the car tells other individuals that they have been kidnapped and asks them to wake up. The kidnapper thinks that they are about to mutate into the monsters. The kidnapper brings a bottle of medicine close to the boy's nose. The boy murmurs if they are human traffickers. Are they going to kill them? He then tells the kidnapper that he is perfectly safe. With the help of the Redemption Association, his mental state is quite stable, so he would not mutate into a monster. 
He tells him that even his wife left him because of his minster genes, and his child is alone at home waiting for him to come. The boy cries. The kidnapper says that he should not be worried as his son is also on the list because he is also a carrier. The kidnapper makes him smell the medicine and tells him to sleep. Falcon tells Zinkun that he is a rank 3 transgender, so he should get ready to turn into ashes with his point-blank lighting. Zinkun throws fire on him. Falcon says that fire and electricity would not cancel each other, so they are affected. Zinkun says that since his blue fire is just a spark, he will be fine and throw Falcon. Falcon's hands get red, and he wonders why this small spark hurts. He thinks that is why his opponent is uninjured. He asks Zinkun if he is trying to save all of them and tells him that they are monster gene carriers. He says they will turn into monsters soon and bring chaos to this world. He says killing them justice and using them for a purpose is a service for the public. Zinkun says he should better run away as he does not know with whom he is dealing. He says that human trafficking has nothing to do with justice. Falcon says someone needs to do that dirty work and asks him how he knows about human trafficking. Zinkun puts his foot on Falcon's face and says he will tell him about the in and out of his Redemption Association. Falcon says that he does not know anything about the Redemption Association. Zinkun says they found the right time to modify the location trackers implanted in the neck of the carrier, making them appear as if your people legally killed them after they transformed into the monsters. Then, they sell those people to the fan family's secret experimental lab. Falcon asks how he knows about that. Zinkun asks him how many innocents they have killed. He replies who cares, after all, they are using them for experiments, they are a threat to society. He says soothing them only slows down their transformation, while killing them removes the problem permanently. He asks Falcon to shut up and says he will only speak when asked to do so. Falcon tells him that the Redemption Association was founded three years ago. It presented itself as an organization where people with monster carriers could confide and find comfort with each other. However, six months later, they organized hundreds of large monster gene carriers confession gatherings across the country. Then they used some method to force them to mutate into their minster form and killed all of them. He adds it was exposed when people discovered that they had been recording and selling all the carrier's personal information. They sold them to the fan family for various experiments to obtain the life essence and the research data, but by then, the fan family had already destroyed all the evidence and there left no leads to be found. He says he only knows a delivery route mentioned in the news by a high-ranking Redemption Association member. He tells him that besides this, the fan family has another purpose for the captured monster gene carriers, which is to feed the underground monsters. Zinkun asks him how many experimental bases the fan family has. He says only one. Zinkun pushes his foot on his face. Falcon pleads with him not to do that and says he only knows about one base. Zinkun says what he thinks that his head can handle if he keeps deceiving him like that. Falcon says that his head is about to explode and says that he is confessing. He tells Zinkun that there are numerous monster factories and experimental bases all over the country. Zinkun asks him how many are near King Chu City. Falcon says he only knows about one he can take him there. Zinkun asks him if he knows something about the underground monsters. Zinkun says that it seems like he is a low-ranking member and does not know about the confidential information and asks him to take him to the location. Falcon agrees that he will take him to the experimental base, but later he says that his hands are still usable to take his head off. He says that he cannot let him live as he has seen his face. Zinkun attacks him and says that his shrieks should be loud enough to be heard by his companion in the car. Falcon thinks that even if he is prepared how can he grab his palm with his left hand directly and not use his ability of blue flames. Zinkun holds his hand tightly and says that, unlike him, he trusts the path of those who escape more and mutates into his monster self. Falcon says oh crap, he is a monster. How can he escape from a monster who has a hide of copper and bones of iron? Zinkun roars. Falcon thinks that he cannot fight him with the help of his electricity. The scene shifts to the car. The other kidnapper thrusts the medicine bottle into the mouth of the boy and says that it is his son who is giving him the courage to hold his breath for so long. He says that he would have dislocated his jaw if he did not have a high percentage of the monster genes. Meanwhile, he sees Zinkun and wonders how the electrical can be taken down so quickly. He says he must not be an ordinary foe if he has taken his companion so easily. He says that safety comes first and he cannot be blamed if the cargo gets exposed. He runs away. 
The boy says thanks to Zinkun for saving their lives. He tells him that they are already dead. Their location trackers have been maliciously altered to register as monsterized and dead. He tells him that they do not know the guys who set them up are the Redemption Association. He advises them not to let anyone know they are still alive and not return to the city. He tells him his son is still there and what he should do now. The Transcendence Institute is located on an island just outside Nanyu City. This place used to be the stronghold of Nansha City. But 20 years ago, monsters and transcenders first appeared in the world. The transcenders were weak and the monsters were mercilessly destructive. Five years later, humans paid a tremendous price to exterminate the monsters and bring peace and stability to society. However, Nan Sha City was already dead by then. Later, Nan Yu City's exterminators established various faculties there, including the Transcendence Institute and the Genetic Research Institute, which are training grounds for anything related to transcenders. Zinkun follows the kidnapper to the Fan family's experimental base and finds out that it is in the ruins of Nan Sha City that the Fan family built the monster factory. The kidnapper enters the factory where so many monsters are tied with chains. He looks into the camera for identification. He says that the factory's first line of defense is quite troublesome. He takes off his mask and says that every time they come in, they have to listen to the noise of the monsters. If someone intrudes, they can detect it immediately. Even a transgender with an invisibility attribute can be detected by the monsters. Someone asks him where Electric L is and what happened to the shipment this time. He says he is about to ask the same if there is some information that gets leaked. He tells him that someone came there and Electric L is most likely to be dead by now. He says he is thankful to God that he senses something is wrong and abandoned the shipment to return. He says that time is short, so he opens the door. He has to ask Supervisor Song what is going on. Someone asks him if he is sure that no one is following him. He says that he is a three-star ranked wind elemental transcender who can keep up with him unless that gay has a damn good nose. He says even if he follows him here, would he be able to cross the first line of defense? He says if he comes, he will become the food of the monsters. The door opens and he steps in. The security guard says that a shadow is flashing by the first line of defense. The man sitting in front of the camera screen wonders why the monsters did not make any sound. He should check other monsters. His fellow says that if there are any intruders, they are most likely to appear in the ventilation shaft position. Zinkun says that just as he expected, the rank 1 monster will not be recognized as long as no monster genes are in his stomach. They will consider him as one of these. He silently moves among the monsters and they do not make any sound. He says that there are quite a few blind spots from the surveillance. He says he will make a hole in the wall to get inside. The scene shifts to the quarantine room, a researcher asks why the shipment has not arrived yet as they are running short of supplies. The researchers have a man lying unconscious in front of them for some experiments. Soon, the man awakes and cries badly. The researcher asks his fellow that he did not remove his vocal cords earlier. He says how could he be so unprofessional? He tells him since the man did not move so, he thinks that if he extracts the monster's genes directly, those monsters will turn into smoke in a short period. He says that if they want to send these monster genes to the level 2 laboratory, they need to handle them first. The first researcher says they must remove the monster genes when they are still alive without letting them die, as their bodies are containers for them. He adds that even if they lose their limbs, they will not mutate into monsters, but letting them make noise is quite a hassle. He says handling the material should be done with utmost care without a single mistake. He tells his fellow that they should not create problems for the other researchers. The man lying on the stature begs him that he can do anything to him, but please spare his wife. He tells him that her body's genes are quite low. The researcher opens his mouth to remove his vocal cords. The man again says it is hard for her to become a monster, so please spare her. The man's eyes turn red as the doctor proceeds with the procedure. The man curses the researchers and says that they all will die miserably and they will not find peace in their afterlife. When the man makes noise, the researcher tells his fellow that if it happens like this, the other researcher will face distraction and the likelihood of research failure will increase. He says if this happens to be the most critical experiment, then he is essentially obstructing human progress. He takes the instrument into the mouth of the man and tells his fellow to be vigilant and meticulous. As the researcher proceeds with the experiment there comes a blackout. 
the researcher asks his fellow to go and check the backup power supplies as they have not been activated yet. Someone tells the supervisor Song that someone has cut the wires and there is no power supply in the whole factory. The masked man asks supervisor Song if they have got any information leaked as they are ambushed. The supervisor Song asks him why he is standing around and not checking the power supplies. He calls the masked man a troublemaker and blames him for being ambushed and says that the man who followed him cut the power supplies of the factory. He replies how is that possible in the presence of the first line of defense. Supervisor Song asks security to initiate a level 1 alert. Supervisor Song dials the number of fan family and tries to tell them there appears to be a problem in factory number 3, but he fails to inform them. The masked man says that the intruder follows him here. He must have a death wish. The security team asks Supervisor Song to give them instructions. Song tells him to find the intruder. The moment they turn to work on the instructions, Zin Kun knocks down all of them. Zin Kun says that their bodies, minds, and even souls smell like crap. He adds that his late night snacks are quite bad. Supervisor Suns asks him if he has come for the monster's genes. He says that the monster's gene carriers are a threat to society, so they are making them useful. Since he has no ideas and Berg in to obstruct them, he might stay and be their subject. He says the security guards do not serve much purpose since they are merely doing the grunt work. He tells Zinkun that he should not worry the real security is already there. Meanwhile, a man comes and attacks Zinkun with fire. Zinkun says that finally someone stupid enough to burg death comes. The masked man also gets ready to attack and says he is here to avenge Electric L. Supervisor Song thinks about who this intruder is. Is he an exterminator sent by the institution's Dean King Chi? He says, how dare he come here alone and wreak havoc in his monster factory. He adds that they have a three-star ranked early-stage wind elemental transcender and two three-star mid-stage ranked special guards with a secret medicine that they possess. He says that even if he is a four-star transcender, he will stay here and extract his genes chain. The masked man attacks Zinkun with a whirlwind, while the other person attacks him with a flaming staff. Zingun blocks these attacks and strikes back with his blue lord flames. When the fire attacker identifies him as a fire elemental, he tells him they have a laboratory dedicated to studying the fire element. He says that it seems like he is showing off his sword in front of Guan Yu. He again attacks Zin Kun with flames and feels that there is something wrong. The masked man summons his whirlwind and says the blue flames are absorbing his powers. The flame attackers wonder how he manages to absorb their powers. One of them says that they must have learned some self-destructive skill chart Zinkan knocks the masked man down and says that he has at least a hundred days to recover from this self-inflicted injury. The masked man says that this is his self-destruction ability of the intruder and adds he is also familiar with these types of moves. Zinkun says to the masked man that the power he is using is similar to showing off by sacrificing his life, but can he use it twice in a row? Zinkun swings his hand in the air and hits the masked man. The security guards notice that his half-body has been crushed as if hit by a truck. The fire attacker, who has stitches on one of his eyes, says that it seems like a three-star monster is beating a man. He says it seems like he has a few tricks up on his sleeve to use such extreme moves in succession. He notices his weakness as well, that he can explode only in a small area. He tells his fellow that as long as they maintain a distance with him they can beat him. They attack him with fire flames from a distance. Zinkun manages to block their attack. Supervisor Song thinks that only those who successfully cultivated an elemental star chart can evolve in the three-star transcender, but that does not mean that all three-star transcenders can use the power of the three-star chart. He says that he has been studying the abilities of the fan family for years, so he is quite familiar with fire elemental abilities. He notices that Zinkun is not using the abilities of an elemental star chart. What he is using is pure elemental power and pure physical strength. The fire attackers say that their flames are overwhelmed by his powers. They say the elemental chart is stronger than they think, even their ranged attacks would not hit him. The fire attacker throws crimson fire seeds onto Zinkun. The overwhelmed fire attackers say they must be bedridden for half a month. Supervisor Song says that the crimson fire seeds are the trump card of their factory. It is a drug prepared by the Fan family using the external flame found deep underground. It can temporarily boast the power of flames of fire elemental transcenders and allows the three-star transcender to evolve into the rank four. 
One of the flame attackers says that he feels himself filled with destructive power, and not dealing with the intruder would be a walk in the park. He says to Zinkan to come towards him and take his power of four-star rank. Supervisor Song says it seems like the intruder has flames that are very much like the one the Fan family seeks to have. He says that they want to master it fully to break through the powers of a 90% transcended gene carrier. Zinkun attacks the fire attacker with the Lord Flames, the fire attacker identifies it as Eternal Flames from the underground world. The fire attacker wonders that though they have increased their power temporarily, it is still not working on him. Zinkun smashes the fire attackers and enters the quarantine room. Supervisor Singh says to him that his transcended gene's powers must be extremely high to the point that his flames change the quality. He adds that he has been shown enhanced physical properties that only those possessed whose transcended genes exceed 90%. He says his flames underwent a property evolution similar to the underground eternal flames. Zinkun asks him where the eternal flames can be found. Supervisor Song says that he will take him there if he joins them. He tells him that they are with the Fan family. He says with his highly transcended power, he will be highly valuable to them. He adds that if they use them to unlock the underground secrets, they can significantly contribute to the world. He says they should not be at odds and join hands to become great. Zinkun says that he has already killed their people. Supervisor Song says that who cares about the security persons? He says as long as the researchers are fine, they have no problem. He says he should worry that the Fan family would not mind losing a few low rankled grunts. Soon, a monster entered the room and attacked Supervisor Song's fellow researcher. Zinkun says that he means that he has killed all of their people, including all the researchers. He says that he freed all the monsters and sealed all the doors going outside so that the monsters only hunt inside. He says all of the researchers force them to mutate now they will devour all of them. That is fair enough. Supervisor Song calls Zinkun a damn human and says that these monsters genes carriers are the scum of society and they do on them by researching recycling. He asks him what is wrong with that and how helping them will benefit him. Zinkun puts his mutated hand on the man lying on the bed and says that it is his right to take revenge on his fellow companions. He closes the eyes of the man, tells him to rest well, and says that he will help them all to take revenge from the Fan family. Song says that if he is crazy, the Transcenders are his companions, not these monsters. Zinkun holds Song by his neck and asks him to tell the location of the Eternal Flames, otherwise he will regret being alive. He agrees to tell him the location. A few more monsters enter the room and growl wildly. Supervisor Song tells him that the location is Nan's Sha Scrap Factory. Zinkun asks him how he knows that. Zinkun says that he knows that he is lying around to waste his time, but he has let some truth slip. Ha says he can judge him by his expression that he has hit the nail on the head. He tells Song that his knowledge of King Chu City is deeper than he thinks. He says the way that place has turned, the Fan family would not be in the dark. He says his stalling is waiting for the reinforcement. He then tells Song that is also waiting for their reinforcement. Zinkun tells him that when a person comes to a place as inconspicuous as this reinforcement, one should not make a big fuss. He adds the person must be a four-star rank transcender for sure. He takes the supervisor's song high by holding his back and says why he did not think the monsters he created could kill him one day. The supervisor, Song, cries. Zinkun asks him if he has seen a monster Zinkun punches him, tears him into pieces, and says that it is correct that he has guessed. He says that he does not know any elemental chart. He says he can already sense the scent of powerful transcended genes from above. Zinkun thinks that since that monster factory is filled with monsters, the party would not come in so rashly. He says that the exit here is a small area. So if he exits from here, he would not avoid him. He says he will wait for his prey to come to him, so he is free to search around and see where is here that can be used. He finds a fridge full of life essence and thinks about how the Fan family got hold of these. He notices the life essence available there is purer than the one the school provides. He thinks he knows that the Fan family is a big shot, so he has chosen the right partner. He looks at the stored life essence and thinks this is what he needs since Yu will probably finish that little stash from back within three days, so let's confirm that. Then he looks at the three pills of crimson fire that the fire attackers take and thinks about grabbing them too. He turns toward the monsters and asks them if they have taken the food to their fill and then says that it is now their turn. He thinks it feels like deja vu from the monster attack on the city from a past life. 
He then smiles and says he will send them all on their way. After eating all the monster, he says after getting his belly full and getting hydrated, it is time to return. He drags a box full of life essence. Soon, a man came his way and said he had been waiting for him for a long time. The man says to Zinkun that he is quite ruthless and makes the monsters devour the whole research institute in the monster factory. He says that he envies him that he gets to witness such a massive feast with his own eyes. He shows him his middle finger and says that he will reward him. The man attacks him with heavy fire flames and says that since he has not had fun, he will get his satisfaction from him. Zinkun says that he had not expected that the four-star transgender who arrived would be the same as he had seen in the news. Zinkun recognizes him as the Earth Elemental four-star ranked transgender who has recently awakened his gravitational power. He remembers that his transgender has used his power to kill 13 women. After that incident, he was eliminated from an S-Class exterminator team. He says the fan family plays dirty by recruiting people like him. The man passes an evil smile and says that if he keeps up with the current news, then he must understand his current situation. He throws sharp pieces of stones at Zinkun and says that his worst nightmare has begun. Zinkun restrains his attack. The man says that since he knows him already, he should also know that he will crush him in the next few hours with the power of gravity. He says he will snap his tendons and ligaments just like those women. He teases Zinkun and says that he will be begging him on the ground. He hits the ground with a punch and says Zinkun to beg for his quick death. He throws a heap of stones at him and asks him to scream louder so that he can hear him through the rocks. He notices a blue flame coming out of the heap of rocks and sees that the blue flame can block the attack of his earth blades. He says if he can block his earth blades, it is no wonder he infiltrated the monster factory by himself. He says to Zinkun that he is stronger among three star ranked transcenders, so fighting with him will be fun. He then attacks Zinkun with Elemental Life Heavy Earth Star Chart from level 2 of his gravitational power. Zinkun thinks that even with his Lord Flames, he cannot break through his abilities, which means the four star rank transcenders are quite strong. He says he wonders how many levels of his Earth's gravity he has not used yet, so he will make a good decoy. The four star rank transgender peeps into the heap of rocks. Zinkun says that he should save some strength to run later. Hearing this, the Transcender laughs and says that it is fun to have tough talks. He says to Zinkun that he will see how long he can endure and beg for his mercy. He punches into the heap of rocks and says the longer the better. The aura of the rank 3 Transcender is released. Zinkun uses his extreme left hand mutation to attack him. Transcender wonders what he did to release such an extreme aura. He attacks back with level 3 Absolute Earth Defense. Zinkun uses his mutated hand and pushes Transcenders under the heavy heap of rocks. He then takes out his tendril and attaches it to the back of the Transcender. Transcender laughs and says that he is scratching his back. He asks Zinkun if he is trying to run when he is not looking. He says that he would not get a chance to run under his gravitational power. He asks Zinkun why he is suddenly withdrawing all his aura. Is he giving up? He says he has not even gotten a chance to be excited yet. Zinkun says yes to him. He says he is trying his best to envelop his body with his 1% elemental power and trying to prevent his monster's genes from leaking out. Transcender feels an earthquake and asks if there is something coming out from the underground. Big cracks appear on the ground. Zinkun laughs and says that the earth dragon would not be able to see him as his tendril is on the transgender, and he has his smell all around his body. Transcender feels something coming out from the ground and applies his third level earth fortification power. He fails to block the earth, and a big dragon emerges from the ground. Transcender curses his luck for meeting Zinkun and the earth dragon. When he notices that the thing coming out of the ground is an earth dragon, he says no wonder why he failed to block it. He notices the earth dragon is staring at him, but is unable to comprehend why the earth dragon is coming after him. He remembers the boy has told him to save his strength to run later. He wonders how the boy has done this to him. The earth dragon attacks the transgender. Zinkun says goodbye to both of them, takes the box full of life essence, and leaves the place. He says that he is leaving it up to exterminators now as he has revealed the tumor of the apocalypse from the future one year earlier before them. The scene shifts to the exterminators. Exterminator Shang Guangqiu tells others that the target is approaching from 500 meters. They ask her if she can provide them with some more details. One of them asks her if there is some other team to assist them. 
Shang Guangqiu replies that to restrain the Earth Dragon only their team is enough. She asks her team to prepare the binding formation and says that tonight they will receive the honor of being the first Huazia to defeat the Earth Dragon. One of the team members whispers that it is an Earth Dragon that even a four-star transcender avoids and she is planning to defeat him solo. She says go and prepare formation. The team members prepare the flowstone formation 300 meters north, 267 meters west, 206 meters east, 150 meters south, 88 meters northeast, and 12 meters southeast. Shang Guangqiu says there were so many people and obstacles last time and it managed to escape. It is so infuriating. He says the high-ups have already told her to guard King Chu City properly, so as long as the Earth Dragon does not die she will not be able to find a partner. She determines to cut the Earth Dragon down this time. She asks her team to hold on as she notices there is someone in front of the Earth Dragon. She angrily asks who the hell he is. One of the exterminators identifies that he is Sonic Wave Modeling, who murdered 13 women. He wonders if he is not executed. Shang Guangqiu says he is a death row inmate who killed women so she will kill both of them. She attacks them with a water dragon slash. Sonic Wave thinks that someone come to save him he later realizes that they are going to kill him. He tries his Earth Level 4 and 5 Absolute Defense to free himself from the Earth Dragon. Meanwhile, Shang Guangqiu swings her wand and attacks the dragon. Sonic Wave manages to free himself from the Earth Dragon. He says he is so lucky that he meets some people who want his life, otherwise he would not be able to free himself from the Earth Dragon. He then says that he has failed to complete his mission tonight, so he does not know what Fan Yan Wai is going to do with him. While thinking about this, he soon finds himself in the grip of another Earth Dragon. Shang Guangqiu was shocked to see another Earth Dragon coming out of the ground. She says what the Earth is consuming these days. She thinks these are the few abnormal creatures that the experts were talking about. She wonders if two of them are there, then how many would be there underground. She wonders how long these creatures are and wonders if anyone has ever seen their tails. She tells his team to control it and does not let it escape. She attacks the dragon with her stick and says she will slice it till it is dead. She jumps on the mouth of the dragon. One of her companions tells her not to jump on the mouth of the dragon, as its teeth are incredibly strong. She says if it is so then it has to bite her first. She targets the dragon's mouth with a dragonized slash. One of the members says that it seems like Shang Guangqiu's water dragon has come to life, and they are going to have a five-star rank transcender here in Huazia, Sister Shang Guangqiu. Someone cheers that Shang Guangqiu did an excellent job and finally killed the earth dragon. Shang Guangqiu cuts the dragon from the mouth downwards and says she has severed its life force now, and she does not expect him to regenerate on its own like the last time. As she cuts the dragon downward, she tries to confirm the length of the dragon and wonders if it is in hundreds. She sweats seeing the length of the dragon and thinks about how monster genes can cause animals to mutate into monsters as large as hundreds of meters. She thinks her power is insufficient to explore further and going down personally is dangerous. She feels she cannot go down further. When her team members cheer at her victory, she thinks that the Earth Dragon is just like a monster if she really managed to kill it. The scene shifts to the Fan family's residence and the Eternal Flames research base. The researcher seems busy in the observation of a huge thing coming out of the ground. Fan Shizai asks someone to give him the report on the monster factory. The informer says that the monster factory faculties in the ruins have been destroyed completely. He further says that none of the researchers managed to survive. He adds the Redemption Association members who are responsible for this have also been reported as dead. He further tells him that their assassin is missing and expected to be eaten by the Earth Dragon. He says that although the monster factory has been exposed to the public, all the security measures have been successfully activated and critical data within the faculty has been destroyed automatically. He says that as per instructions, they informed the exterminators that it was just a monster research institute. He says half of the high ups of the extermination department will hold them answerable for that. He adds that they are currently discussing what punishment should be given for the unauthorized construction of the monster research laboratory. Fan John Wai says he presumes it will be a verbal reprimand. He asks him who is behind this. The boy replies that the supervisor of the monster factory sent a message before he was killed. In that message, he mentioned blue flames. 
Fan John Y asks if that person is suspected to be a transcender with a high power fire attributed to transcended genes to the point of approaching the level of eternal flames. He says if it is so, then he is the key to opening the everlasting blossom that will allow them to have eternal flames. Fan Shizai says fire attribute transcended powers have been there in the four generations of their family already, and they have worked so hard to research and obtain the most powerful fire elemental star chart. He adds they have even excavated the everlasting blossom containing the eternal flame, yet none of them transcended genes above 90%. That's why they have to strive for it themselves. He tries to open the everlasting blossom. He asks if the research on artificial transcended genes is completed or not. He says as long as they can isolate the transcended genes of this blue flame. He, as the legitimate son with the largest number of transcended genes in the fan family, is confident that he can use this key to open the everlasting blossom. That will enable their family to become the absolute dynasty of flames. Fan Jan Y says that right now, the key is to find the blue flame gay, but the question is how they can start the investigation. He says he is a transcender, so let the exterminators help them with that. He tells the boy to inform the extermination department headquarters that their monster research laboratory has been destroyed by the wanted blue flame boy that they are pursuing and valuable materials have been stolen. He tells them he may also be the mastermind behind the appearance of the earth dragon. Fan Shizai touches the eternal blossom and says he will open it one day and retrieve the eternal flames. 5,000 meters below the base for the research of eternal flames, the roots of the eternal blossom touch the head of an earth dragon. The scene shifts to the underground, where Sonic Wave finds himself in a weird place. He notices that everything around is quite sticky and bloody. He soon realizes that he is in the mouth of a monster. He wonders how there can be such a gigantic monster there in the world and what its rank would be. The monster opens its mouth, looks at the broken tendril of Zigkun, says he wants this, and consumes it along with Sonic Wave. The scene shifts to the Institute's hostel. Zinkun says that most of the resources are hidden. They can dig some out when needed. Otherwise, it would be too conspicuous. Zinkun enters Jiyu's room and thinks that the owner of the tail should have realized now the one it pursued is not him. It probably got hold of the broken tip of his tendril. Jiyu asks him if he is back. He gives her a box and tells her he has brought her some supper, which is the essence of high-quality life. He tells her that he has taken some of these and one of these life essence is equal to five to six they have received from the institution. Zinkun thinks that since they can trace him through his aura, will they send monsters after him or continue using the appearance of an earth dragon reconnaissance? If it sticks with the use of the earth dragon, then they will be safe. He thinks perhaps it will continue lurking for another year before erupting again. Perhaps it will initiate a preemptive strike and prevent him from growing stronger. He further thinks that doing so will attract the attention of the exterminators and alert the enemies. He says if the world-ending apocalypse is a terminal cancer, the tumor should manifest as early as possible. The scene shifts to the research base for the eternal flames. The blossom breaks open. The researchers say to each other see the blossom is opening. One of them says the director fan has just left go and call him and tell him there is a great breakthrough in the research. The scene shifts to a group of criminals. One of them says to their captain that he told him that he can activate his elemental life automatically and instantly unlock the golden body armor. He adds that now their captain has become invisible. The captain tells him to stop joking. He then says that they should be thankful to the fan family who gathered these deadly criminals from all over the country. He says that they are a team that the exterminators would be afraid of. He says that there are three four-star transcenders and seven three-star peak transcenders. One of them interrupts the captain and says that he is mistaken six of them have already become four-star transcenders. He says that their cultivation speed is fast here soon all of them will become four-star transcenders. Then they leave for a mission assigned by the fan family. The captain says to his team that no matter who the intruders are exterminators or transcenders do not let any of them survive. He says team A will follow him to block the attacks. One of the members says that she remembers the days when they crashed into the armored trucks to grab some pocket money. Then the captain says that Team B will face the armed enemy forces and instructs them to slice and dice them without holding back. Meanwhile, he replies to the girl that those days feel like a pain in his butt. Then he instructs the Team C to keep check and not let anyone escape. He then tells a boy named Aqui to conceal himself and scavenge everything he can find. 
He tells his team not to make any mistakes and be careful. He says that anyone who infiltrates this top secret research faculty is not a small fry. The captain pushes the door of the research institute and asks his team to ignite adrenaline and join Massacre. They enter the research institute and become the food of the monsters. Kui tries to observe how everyone has gone dead in just an instant. He rushes to the fan family and tells them what happened. He also says that he survived because he had removed all his aura in advance. He tells them that there were no intruders but only monsters formed out of the petals of the everlasting blossom. One of the fan family members says that it is strange that it was not monsters but unopened flowers. He tells them there were four of them who turned invisible. He adds that they can also use the eternal flames. He says that the monsters took down the captain with golden armor in seconds. He says they are stronger than the earth dragon. He says in the end they all end the research faculty and he comes to them as he does not know where to go. He asks Mr. Fan to inform the extermination department about that as the monsters are going to kill many people and the problem is quite deep. He says they cannot handle it on their own this time. Fan Jan Y says that he already told that anyone who leaks what is going on there will be killed. He says a deaf inmate is worried about people this is ridiculous. He then asks his people to strip him of the transcended genes without wasting time. Fan Shizai says to his uncle that just as he said the everlasting blossom has calmed down, its ability to stimulate one transcended genes is even stronger, and just touching it can cause significant changes in the transcended so he will soon advance his elemental life to the four star and gain the eternal flame. Fan Jan Wai says until they strengthen the security he needs to be cautious and should not go close to the everlasting blossom. Then he thinks that he already has suspicions that the everlasting blossom is a mutation deep down, but he does not expect it to transform into marble monsters. He thinks that this is not important what matters is that the monsters can stimulate transcended genes. He then thinks that the number of powerful transcendent members of the fan family will be able to crush the entire world. He says this is a treasure exclusive to the fan family. The scene shifts to Jiyu's room. She asks Zinkun, why is he looking at her this way? Does he again want to eat her? Zinkun replies that he ate his fill tonight and it will take 10 days to digest everything. By then the monster genes will reach their peak in his body. He says before evolving into rank 4 he needs to advance his transcended genes to the rank 3 star first. Then stabilizing the monster's genes with the transcended genes will allow him to manage his size into a human body. He says he has a few transcended genes and to reach rank 3 he requires special means. He takes his hand close to Jiyu and his left hand mutates. He takes out his tendril and asks her to give it a shock to see what happens. She asks him to be gentle. He says it will hurt momentarily and then it will be done. When his tendril touches the neck of Jiyu her transcended powers activate instantly. She says her transcended genes are becoming quite active. He says the results are quite quick. He says that based on his previous experience refining electricity gathers her energy, absorbs all the power from her transcended genes then refines them all. He asks her to keep absorbing according to the student handbook and tells her that any cost of any breakthrough by the students in terms of energy sources will be covered by the institute. The scene shifts to the room of the school principal King Chi who tells him the institute's power circuits are malfunctioning and there is a power outrage everywhere. While taking a sip of tea he says that then there must also be a blackout. The sister asks him to give instructions. He tells her to stay calm and says that they have got the most talented genius in the history of the institute. She is likely to give a breakthrough now so there is nothing to worry about. He adds however the speed of her breakthrough is a bit more than the expectations. He says Jiyu is more of a genius than he thinks. The sister says in that case the electricity bill will be quite high. He says even the electricity bill costs a few million or more no matter after all the talent is priceless. He says that if the expenses turn too high the extermination headquarters reimburse them later. The phone rings and King Chu says that thanks to God the phone lines are separate otherwise they would not be able to make any emergency calls. The extermination headquarters informs King Chu that there is a power outage in the city and the whole power is surging towards the institute. King Chu tells the headquarters that there is nothing to worry about just that one of their students has undergone a power breakthrough. He says that however, they want to file a report for the reimbursement of the electricity bill. Nan Yu Transcendence Institute is located in the King Chu City. King Chu City is the special clearing zone of the Nan Yu City spanning both sides of the river. 
within an area of 36 point square kilometers. Although the special clearing zone is just an island, it is right next to the city center of Nan Yu City within an area of 795.44 square kilometers. This is the third largest city in Huazia. It is incredibly prosperous with a daily electricity consumption of 200 million kilowatts per hour. Now, with the Nan Yu Institute as the epicenter extending to the whole city center, there is a major power outage. All the electricity flowed to the body of Zhiyu. The power plant is supplying at full capacity. Three hours of that intense absorption is equivalent to half a day's electricity consumption in the city center of Nan Yu City. And it is all equivalent to the energy reserves of a four-star ranked transcender. But she was awakened recently. The officer of the extermination department wonders if Jiu's ability to absorb electricity is incredible. King Chu says that the higher the amount of one's transcended genes, the purer they are within the body, and the purer their genes the stronger the elemental reserves, he says they are the natural energy containers. He adds that in summation nothing is to be surprised about. He says the more energy she has the greater her genes probability of undergoing a qualitative change and fewer too will be the bottlenecks she will encounter in the future. He tells her what transcendence organizations are trying to do worldwide is to artificially decipher the secrets of these genes. They used many methods to break through the individual limits of the transcended genes. That is a seemingly visible yet unattainable path. The dean asks the offers about the cost of the electricity bill. She replies it is 56,034,751 yuan. The dean coughs on hearing the cost of the bill. The officer asks if he is fine. He replies nothing his tea is quite hot. The officer says that although he has mentioned how theoretically Zhiyu's cultivation would not encounter any bottlenecks, could it be that she encountered some unexpected situation, still cannot store elemental power in her body, and cannot even reach the star one rank? She adds if it is so then he is throwing 50 million into the water. The dean replies that she took the life essence fluid from the entire class, advancing to the star one rank would be a piece of cake for her. He says if it is so, she would not let all of it waste and instead be in a hurry to find help by now. The sister tells the dean that Jiu is here to meet him. The dean tells her to call her in. Jiu enters the dean's room and greets him. She says she is grateful for the school's help and sorry that after finishing her cultivation practice, she realized that she has consumed an enormous amount of electricity. The dean laughs and says the school has to nurture talent after all. He then asks Jiyu if is she a star one ranked transcender now. Jiyu replies no she is not. The dean gets shocked, puts a hand on his face in sadness, and says he will teach her how to control the electricity. He says with her talent, this should not be a problem. She tells the dean that she is a two star rank as of now. Hearing this the dean stands up and says this is quite quick according to his estimate, she should not have advanced to a two star rank. He says that she has not encountered any bottleneck. Having too many transcended genes requires time for elemental refinement. The dean says he would like to have a look. Some branches appear around Jiu. She thinks when these branches appear around her. She says it seems that they were wholly invisible, not even a moment let out, as if to say they pose no threat, but they are quite formidable. The dean says that her transcended genes are extremely active right now, which is why greatly accelerating the elemental refinement. He adds there are two reasons for heightened transcended genes activity, battling monsters and intense emotions. Jiyu says to the dean that her emotions are quite intense right now. Zinkun tells the dean that she is stiff as a mug, but her chest has a heart. He says, this is not important they have come there to show their gratitude for the institute. He adds they would like to request the cultivation method from an elemental star chart as they aim to make her evolve into the three-star transcender. The dean says that graduating after getting the three-star rank is the standard of the institute and they are already thinking about it just after getting enrolled. He adds the institute has already prepared a suitable star chart for her. He says but for him it is different. He says becoming a two-star transcender means transforming one's transcended genes into elemental genes and achieving a three-star transcendence is about scientifically constructing an elemental star chart using transcended genes much like the fan family fire palm. He says after completion they will be able to develop more powerful uses of basic elements. Haf tells Zinkun that his genes have a defect, which is they are too little to construct a star chart. Zinkun asks if the institute does not have robotic exoskeletons for artificial transcended genes enhancement assistance. 
Then he thinks that technology would not help prevent the apocalypse, but it can help him to break through to two-star transcendence. The dean frowns and asks how he knows about it. The dean says it is reasonable if he is keeping tabs on news about the transcenders. He says there are brief research reports about the success of artificial robotic transcendence, but then they were removed. He tells them they did so not to conceal the information from the public, but because the technology was immature. He adds the exterminators could indeed replace transcended genes with machinery, but it only worked with those with less than 40% of transcended genes. He says moreover the critical point is that enhancing a bit of strength for those with few transcended genes requires a massive amount of life essence fluid. And it seems like killing a mosquito with a cannon. Zinkun whispers that is it perfect for him as a massive amount of life essence fluid is easy to come by. He says all of his classmates are generous and easygoing after all. The dean says he should make stealing look elegant. Zinkun says to the dean that he is misunderstanding him. The dean says the thing is not cheaper like the electricity that Ji Yu consumed. Zinkun says that means there is nothing they can do about it. He says goodbye to the dean. Zinkun whispers to Ji Yu that as long as they persist, they will definitely succeed. Ji Yu tells him that she cannot hold the electricity that she absorbed, so she should release it so she can absorb it again tomorrow. Zinkun replies that if they cannot hold it tomorrow night either, then they will absorb it again the night after. The dean overhears their whispers. He asks both of them to come back. He says he gives Zinkun a chance. Zinkun says long live Dean. The dean tells him to shut up. The dean holds his hands under his chin and asks Zing if he does not already have a team. He says the institute is about to hold a competition for supernovas. He says if his team makes it, he will provide him with an artificial robotic transcendent genes enhancement armor allocated by the extermination department to the academy. Zinkun joins his hands before the dean, praises him, and says he will for sure lead his team to become supernovas. The dean tells them that there are only three days left for the registration of supernovas selections. They thank the dean, say goodbye, and leave his room. The sister tells the dean that they cannot achieve the status of supernovas. She adds biennial national transcended championship selects the strongest team from transcendence institutions from all over the world and they are just first year freshmen. They cannot compete with other students even with the talent of Jiu. She adds moreover the other two members of their team have not even awakened yet. The dean replies it is hard to say. The sister asks if is it because of Jiu's talent. The dean says it is about the boy beside her. The dean asks the sister to remember when the old man Fan Jan Y wanted to stop him from enrolling citing his 1% almost negligible transcended genes. She says of course she remembers when he gave him a chance to participate in the final trial. She says everyone was puzzled due to his transcended genes being practically indistinguishable from not. The dean says but the boy did pass the trial. The dean says his transcended genes are on the verge of non-existence yet, there are anomalies when he checked his high school fitness data. The dean says the boys have secrets. He adds his years of experience say that the boy is not as simple as he appears to be. She asks the dean if is not e researching the monster genes. She says he always addresses the issues related to abnormalities in those who carry monster genes. She says she never knew that he also studied students' physical fitness dates. The dean takes the talk in another direction and says that he has given the boy an impossible task. Even if he completes the task, it is a win-win. The dean tells the sister to start her work and appreciates her for her hard work. He says he is sorry that she kept working with the outrage till dawn. She replies it is her duty. The dean leaves alone in his room, the phone beeps again. The director of the extermination department asks why he called so late. The dean addresses director Zhu in a polite tone that tells him to consider Zhiyu's electricity bill on his behalf otherwise he will resign tomorrow. The scene shifts to the Nan Yu Institute where Shang Guangqiu says to her fellows that there are 90% chance that the blue flame is from the first-year freshmen. The exterminators get instructions to investigate all first-year students. They get orders to find the blue flame who not only implicate the exterminators but also steal important data from the Fan family's laboratory. Exterminators Nai Yang and Lin Kai visit the dean's office. They greet the dean. The dean says that it has been quite a while since they visited last time. Nai Yang tells the dean that they are quite busy. The dean asks Lin Kai how it feels as he makes his first visit after graduation. Lin Kai says the institute has not changed a bit in years, but it seems that it runs short of the funds. 
Na Yang interrupts calls Lin Kai an idiot and says that he must have heard wrong. Lin Kai says to Na Yang that he said that if the institute were led by Fan Jian Wai, it would probably be rolling in the riches. Na Yang pushes Lin Kai aside and says that there is no time for these things. So let's jump to the real business. The dean says that is the truth anyway, speak up. Na Yang tells the dean Queen Kai that this time besides judging the selection of supernovas, they are also assigned the task to find the blue flame. Queen Chi asks why the extermination department thinks that the blue flame is in their academy. Na Yang asks Lin Kai to go ahead and explain. Lin Kai begins and tells the dean that on June 25 year 2025 around 10.30 p.m., when he was clearing the monsters at the Shen market, he encountered the blue flame. He then stands up and says due to an unexpected situation, his arm was bitten by a monster. It was then that he appeared out of nowhere and helped him. He adds but then for some reason, he knocked him unconscious. He says when he woke up the monsters were already dead, and in his haze he saw that he was absorbing the black smoke left by them. Lin Kai says the lighting was dim, so he could not see his face clearly, but based on his overall judgment, he can say that he was a young male. So the captain speculated that he was a teenager who suddenly awakened strong transcended power, someone mentally immature, impulsive and seeking excitement. He adds he has never seen such a level of speculation before. Na Yang adds that they would not be in a hurry if it was just that, but recently his pursuit of excitement escalated significantly. He tells the dean that yesterday Fan family reported the Blue Flame's reappearance and attack on the important laboratory, stealing life essence storage, resulting in the death of all the Pernunnels withstand. He says he is becoming more and more dangerous, so they need to make haste and apprehend him. He says moreover considering the age he first appeared when the institution opened, coincidentally too in King Chu City where the institution is located. So, he may be a newly enrolled student. Lin Kai says once they find he would not hesitate to knock him down. The dean takes a sip of tea and says that as per their expressions, they are very certain that he is from the institute. Lin Chi tells the dean it is because, ever since the day he knocked him down, he can feel a strange connection between them. He says whether it is some bizarre transcendence resonating from the bump of his forehead, he gave him remains to be seen. He says this feeling cannot be wrong. He says the moment he stepped into the school he sensed the blue flame. He says he wants to figure out this connection. Na Yang says that they must apprehend the blue flame, and for that, the extermination bureau is not just investigating the institution, all the new students will be thoroughly checked. The dean tells them all the newcomers are training in the elemental field, so it is the perfect time for them to head there. The scene shifts to the elemental ground. Bo Liang tells the students that the institute offers various courses on different elements of training and martial arts. The students are told that if they feel any sort of difficulty in the training they can seek guidance from any teacher. In addition, they can practice in the elemental field. The teacher tells the students that there is an installation below that establishes the cycle of the five elements, metal, wood, fire, water, and earth. He further tells them under this installation their transcended genes will become more active. Bo Liang tells them that for those who have already awakened, it can accelerate the progress of training, and for those who have not awakened, yet it can increase the probability of awakening. He tells them to enjoy training today, and when the next time they will come to this field they will be under evaluation. He says he suggests they should find suitable opponents for sparring, because combat is always the best way to enhance one's transcended genes. He asks them to start training. He then calls Zinkun and Jiu to come for a while. They walk away with Bo Liang. Boys from the alliance bully Sheng and Xiaotao call them non-awakened rebels and ask them to become their opponents. Sheng says he will spur Will Xiaotao as they are a bit lacking so he might hurt them. The boys from the alliance group say that they have stubborn mouths and add that they are living in suffering and dying to save little face. The boys say to Sheng and Xiaotao that they will teach them a lesson through a friendly match. They ask Sheng and Xiaotao how dare they snatch their resources they should better return them. They say Zinkun cannot protect them always. Bo Liang puts his hand on his forehead and says to Zinkun and Jiu that the dean agreed to their outrageous demand and they took the dean's absurd mission. And now the dean has instructed him to help their team as much as possible. So he is the mentor of their group currently. He says to be honest, they do not even meet the minimum requirements for registration in the supernova selection. He tells them the lowest criterion for a leader is to have three-star rank transcendence power at least. 
he says they should be thankful to Shang Guangqiu for this otherwise the standard would be the same for them, and they would not stand a chance. He tells them back in the day when Shang Guangqiu joined a team of second-year students during her first year with her two-star transcendence power, she outturned a three-star examiner. Since then the standard changed, so they can follow the example of Shang Guangqiu and join a team of second-year students. However, having a low amount of transcended genes can make him excluded. Zinkun says there is no need for that they are fine with their current team members. Bo Liang that means in their team one has a burden of three, two awakened, and one with one percent genes. Zinkun feels a strange sensation. He feels like it is the exterminator whose arm was accidentally bitten off is here. He thinks this is a complete resonance between identical transcended genes, so he can also sense him. He thinks he cannot let him discover him so he needs to cover his transcended genes with his minster genes. He says he has to block the connection. Bo Liang says to Zinkun that he knows that the principal has given him the starry sword star chart, a technique that can theoretically be used even with a smaller amount of the genes. He says to Zinkun that his aptitude is quite low so he cannot use it without armor. He further tells him that without the starry sword chart, he cannot manipulate the elements based on it. He adds that he cannot perform that technique. Bo Liang says unless he can sense someone else's element and imitate them let Ji Yu be the captain of the team. He says they will register first and then think about what they can do later. Bo Liang asks Ji Yu to hit him with all that she has. She tells him that she can use her full force but activation needs a few moments so please hold on. Bo Liang finds her expression dangerous and asks her to shoot first toward the sky. On the other hand, a boy from the alliance group attacks Jia Sheng and says that his leader cannot protect him forever tigers take their guards down sometimes, so what if they have 95% genes? Meanwhile, Ji Yu shoots his power toward the sky, and a dazzling light blurs the sight of everyone. Seeing this the alliance boys say to bow down in admiration and admit that Jia Sheng is enlightened. They say their resources are ready to be favored by their leader. Jia Sheng's eyes spark in admiration and he says his sister-in-law is awesome. Ji Yu asks Bo Liang if her power is acceptable. Bo Liang says for sure. Bo Liang later thinks that she is such a demoness, though she is a little slow, but she can achieve this much by relying on the elemental outbursts. He further thinks that if she practices the chart given by the Dean she can turn into a human nuclear plant. Secretary Yang calls Bo Liang aside for a moment. Ji Yu asks Zeng Kun if he is alright, Soon Bo Liang calls all the students and asks everyone to gather around. The students whisper about what is going on. Nai Yang says to Lin Kai that he leaves this to him and asks if he found that person. Lin Kai tells him that he is here, but the resonance disappeared just now. He adds no matter he can still find him. Meanwhile, metal comes forth from above. Lin Kai reflects on what happened two months ago. The scene shifts back to two months ago where Lin Kai asks an exterminator about the situation. The exterminator identifies him as a captain by his uniform and informs him that the vice captain lured all the monsters run down building so they would not harm the civilians. He asks the exterminator to convey his order to the vice captain to evacuate the building. The exterminator informs the vice captain that captain from the another district ordered him to evacuate the building. The exterminator wonders when he sees Lin Kai gathering iron around him. He sees him drawing the building's rebars and thinks about how he seems to be using much elemental power. He wonders how he is manipulating a thousand pounds with a few grams of force. Then Lin Kai used myriad sword strikes and the building collapsed. Nia Yang shouts who the hell bombed the building. He says he does not care from which district, the captain came he will make him pay for it. Lin Kai comes and and satutes the vice captain. He introduces himself as the newcomer on the duty. Nia Young asks him why is he wearing a captain's coat. He says he is wearing just an ordinary jacket with 280 centimeters high aura. The scene returns to the present. Nia Young remembers the previous experience and advises Lin Kai to not make a mess around. He says if he destroys the Five Elements Formation Plaza, he and Lin Kai will become slaves for the next 20,000 years to pay the debt. He calls the vice captain stubborn and says that there is enough metal hidden inside the plaza than he thinks. He again his power of metal comes forth. The students notice metal swords on their heads. They ask what the exterminator wants, they wonder if he considers them monsters. Zin Kun thinks so he can sense the metal hidden in his body. He says Lin Kai is embedding his metal inside them to forcefully sense him out. He feels his transcended genes are getting stripped out. 
He thinks his monster's genes can suppress them though. He thinks will he not be able to use his transcended genes as long as the shorty Lin Kai. He thinks who can guarantee that the one he sensed is the blue flame. Ji Yu comes close to him. He asks her not to be reckless and to maintain distance from him. Lin Kai says he found the blue flame. Zinkun says it is time to test his acting skills. He thinks he is just a freshman who knows nothing. Lin Kai says to Zinkun that he puts him under arrest by the Order of Exterminators for attacking an exterminator and sabotaging Fan Family's research laboratory. Jiao Sheng wonders if his big brother is the Blue Flame. One of the students says that he has seen the most wanted list before, how can Zinkun be him? Another student says Zinkun is annoying. Another says is not the Blue Flame a fire attribute transcendence. Zinkun says right he is a metal attribute transcender. While deep down he thinks that he can clearly see the movement and structure of these elements. He notices he just arranging them this way and pulling them. He remembers Bo Liang's instructions and says that since he can see them he can imitate them easily. He thinks he will just use a little bit of the metal element. He tries to remember what Lin Kai was saying metal forth something. He says to himself it is such a Chunbiu phrase. He calls out the celestial star strike sword and forms a sword of metal. Bo Liang notices that he has used a technique from the myriad sword chart that can be used with a small amount of elements. He wonders if he just learned it by observing Lin Kai. He says this is not something that one can learn by simply spectating. He says he does not even have the myriad star sword chart, he should not be able to do that. Nai Yang tells Lin Kai that the blue flame is a fire attribute transcender, while the boy here is the metal attribute transcender. Lin Kai replies his senses cannot be wrong. He says does using fire means he is of fire attribute. He creates a flame in the air and says that by using a bit of skill, a metal atibit transcender can create fire as well. He tries his skill of extreme velocity and creates fire flames. He then tries his technique of burning stars to create fiery metal blades. Bol Yang says that he can also ignite a single sword while mastering the essence of myriad sword star charts. Bo Liang says it seems like Lin Kai's control even becomes stronger after graduation. He thinks someone with metal attributes and really create fire. He wonders if Zin Kun is really the wanted blue flame if his identity as a new transcender after graduation is just a guise. Zin Kun puzzles on seeing the thunderbolt ignition sword and says he wants to learn that. Lin Kai says be vanquish the blue flame. Zin Kun acts to save himself. Shang Guangqiu reaches there and asks the exterminators to be the judges and tells them to inspect the field set up by the academy. She tells them not to create trouble in the academy. Lin Kai tells Shang Guangqiu that the blue flame is there and asks her to step aside. Mia Yang tells Lin Kai to remain polite while talking to sister Shang Guangqiu. Shang Guangqiu asks Lin Kai if is he telling her to step aside and if is he telling a lady to move. She says she will surely teach a lesson to this insolent little brat. She throws her water dragon towards him. Lin Kai says that he wants to go back to the headquarters. Nia Yang laughs and says he is backing off quite early. Lin Kai says that it is her elemental life that the dragon looks as if it is alive. He wonders if Shang Guangqiu is about to step up to become a legendary 5-star ranked transcender. He says a slap from her would probably smack a 3-star like him to death. Nia Yang says he is right and asks him to return to the headquarters. Lin Kai tells Shang Guangqiu that he will request 17 to 18 of his colleagues from the headquarters to deal with her. Shang Guangqiu remembers her talk with the dean, when the dean tells Shang Guangqiu to tone down her overly flamboyant personality. He says it will save her from setbacks in interpersonal relationships including matters of heart. She asks the dean what he means by matters of heart. She calms down on remembering the dean's advice. She asks Lin Kai that if the blue flame is a metal attribute in disguise, then why did he not see through it at the time? Shang Guangqiu says she was monitoring the campus that night the Fan family's laboratory was destroyed, and no one left the school that night Zin Kun poses innocent. Nai Yang catches Lin Kai by the neck and says that they must have made a mistake. He takes Lin Kai with him and asks him to prepare for the supernova selection. Students dispersed from the ground. Zin Kun calls Shang Guangqiu from behind and says monitoring all the students must be exhausting for her since the institute is quite vast. She says who has the time for monitoring every day. She puts her arm on the chest of Zin Kun and says as per her perception of the man he does not seem a bad boy. Ji Yu coughs and says she has high hopes for sister Shang Guangqiu. 
Shang Guangqiu holds her hands and asks her to quickly cultivate in a three and four star rank transcender so that they can eliminate all the scumbags from the world. She leaves and says that she hopes all of them will study hard. Jia Sheng tells them there are rumors that Shang Guangqiu has encountered scumbags only in relationships. He adds her judgment of men is quite terrible. Jiu says he is remarkably accurate. Zinkun asks Jiao Sheng to bring Xiaotao to Jiu's room tonight, he tells him that he will prepare a special treat for them. Jiao Sheng says yes, Bo Liang observes them and says that the team is not joking when they say that they want to participate in the supernova competition. He says excluding 39% and 41% who have not awakened yet with Jiu's talent and that dark horse Zinkun, though winning victory is unlikely, there is a chance that they will make out the first round. The scene shifts to the registration room for the supernova competition. A bald fat man says to teacher Zhu that the team she is leading this time is the hot favorite for the championship. She says it is not like that and adds that the girl in his team is about to reach the four-star rank. One of them says that the other members are not up to the mark. Another one says that he is not going to spill beans about the secrets of his team. Meanwhile, one of them asks the others if they have heard that the principal personally requested Bo Liang to lead a first-year team in the championship. One of them asks if the first-year students even qualify to register Bo Liang enters the room and says to others the weather is good today and asks them to have a bet today. The scene shifts to the school's Dimitri. One of the Alliance team members says to Jia Shang that he is lucky that Fan Shizai wants to recruit him and his sister to the fourth team of the Fan family. He asks him if he knows the benefit Fan Shizai offers which includes a thousand vials of life essence per year is as much as the bandit Zingun stolen from them. He says he and his sister can use two vials each day, he says, and there is another piece of news for him something huge which is beyond his dreams he will encounter a true benefactor. To seduce Jiao Sheng he tells him that the young master Fan has a method of awakening that he needs the most. Jiao Sheng thinks about awakening. The boy says awakening is the good fortune earned by his ancestors. He says he knows that his sister is repeating grade one for the first time, and he is repeating it for the second time. It is a very sorry state of being. He adds with his aptitude that he has it is very precarious for him to awaken even this year. He asks him if he believes that he has three years of incredible luck to pass the final trial. He says as long he stands by Master Fan he and his sister can awaken. He puts his hand on Zhao Sheng's shoulder and asks him if he is excited that the fate of the Zhao family is about to be rewritten. Zhao Sheng tells him to take off his dirty hands from his shoulder. The boy laughs and says that he is acting superior after allying himself with a powerful figure. He says he will be on his big brother's side as long as he is alive, and even he will be on his side in his death. The boy holds him by his collar and asks why cannot he see the big picture. He asks him if does he not know the consequences of Zinkun's going against the Fan family. He says in the end he has to grove before the Fan family when he lost everything. Jia Shang holds the boy by his collar and says that he will be the most pitiful one and will lose the only chance of awakening. He adds he will take collateral damage and suffer. He tells him that this big brother is not as weak as he thinks and as his younger brother he is not easy to bully also. He kicks the boy and asks him to fight if he has guts. The boy asks him if he remains obstinate. Zhao Shang threatens the boy and says he never knows what will happen to him when he is asleep and then asks him if he prepared himself for one year without peaceful sleep. He says then it is better not to wake him because once he awakens he will fight him till the end. The boy says that he is a mad dog. Zhao Shang tells the boy that he will give him a surprise every night. He calls him a piece of trash who is posing to be protective. The boy punches him. He says without Zinkun he would have died long ago, and now he will spend all his life repaying for that. He says he has urgent matters to attend to. He says to the boy that if he can beat him to death, then he will be on his way, but in terms of fighting he may not be able to beat him, so they will clear their matter later on. The boy clenches his hand in rage. He says he is a coward and making excuses to run away. He calls him a piece of garbage and says that he and his sister both will die. Jiao Sheng ignores him and leaves. The boy tells Fan Shizai that Jiao Sheng is nothing but a loyal god to Zinkun. Fan Shizai says it seems trying to approach someone near Zinkun is not feasible. He then says there is no need to worry he has countless ways to deal with the people. He says he originally used a lenient approach to deal, but he is forcing him to use ruthless methods. Jiao Sheng and Xiaotao knock at the door of Jiu's room. 
Zinkun takes his hand out and pulls them into the room. He asks them if they are ready for the special training. They reply they are ready. Zinkun asks them to close their eyes. Xiaotao asks Jiao Shang why is he removing his socks. He says while they would not intentionally peek they might peek out accidentally. Jiao Shang takes his sock close to Xiaotao and asks her to lean so that he can cover her eyes with his sock. She asks him if he is planning to kill his sister. Zinkun tells to them forget about closing their eyes. What is more important is that they need to trust him. He asks them to entrust their lives to him. Zhao Shang says that is not a problem and then asks Xiaotao for confirmation. Xiaotao asks Zinkun if he is the blue flame. Zhao Shang interrupts her and asks what is she talking about Zinkun accepts that he is the blue flame. Zhao Shang says big brother is quite strong. He asks Xiaotao how she knows about it Xiaotao says the exterminators would not come for Zinkun without any reason. She says when Lin Kai called him the blue flame she noticed Zinkun's reaction. She says the exaggerated response of Zinkun based on her observation about him made her realize that he was faking. She says she has never seen him panic in crisis. She says Ji Yu's acting was subtle and delicate, but keeping their relationship in view she should not be that restrained. She says she has never seen Ji Yu that much detached before. Jia Shang asks her if is she his sister. He says she is quite clever. She says if both of the kids from the same family become idiots the family would don't. Zinkun says to Ziyoto that she can call him the blue flame, but she should not say that his acting skills are lacking. He says he is the one who took down the villains in the fan family's laboratory and asks them if they still trust him. She says just as her brother said if he had not saved them they would have died long ago though from hindsight, the final test was quite special. She adds it was because the target of the fan family was there in that test. Jiao Shang says that makes sense. She says but this also precisely shows that the fan family has something to hide. She says what they were researching in the laboratory must be something unethical. She says that she does not have a choice as her brother already decided to follow him. Jiao Shang pushes her head and says he has to commit herself. Jiao Shang says even if his opponent is a family as cunning as the fan family both he and Xiaotao will do anything in their power for him. Xiaotao asks him to bring his special training she says they will do whatever he asks them to do. Zinkun offers them two bottles and asks them to drink. Both of them take the drink. Jiu says she is also done and her stomach feels like it is going to explode. Zinukun tells them it all will be absorbed soon. Ziyoto asks Zinkun if the drink is life essence fluid. He tells them he has stolen it from the fan family's laboratory. He says they have drunk up about half of what their class fellows generously gifted to them. Jiao Sheng becomes sentimental and says that is quite extravagant and asks what have they done to deserve that. Xiaodao thinks so this is why Zinkun asked them to entrust their lives because people like them who have not awakened yet for them staking that much amount of this fluid can be risky. She thinks Zinkun must have learned this method from the fan family laboratory. She thinks there must be some devices involved in this. She then thinks there must be something strange and unreliable about that device that he does not let them see. Zinkun tells them now it is time to close their eyes. Both Jiao Shang and Xiaodao lay on the floor. Xiaodao thinks this is a better method to prevent them from peeking than the stupid idea of her brother. Zinkun says he is sorry that he has to keep the monster gene thing secret from them for now. He says it seems that the only way to their transcended genes is from their dreams. Zinkun takes out his tendrils and attaches them and attaches it with the necks of Zhao Shang and Ziyotao. Zinkun thinks Ji Yu's transcended will go berserk with just a little stimulation so he could be reckless with her. But their transcended genes are fewer so he can be a little aggressive with them. He thinks he can directly wave monster genes into their transcended gene chain. He says right now they must be facing nightmares and fears from the depths of their souls and at the same time their transcended genes will try to self-preserve and become active like never before. Zayoto sees a nightmare in which she finds herself in a dark and gloomy place, she finds herself injured. She sees a teddy bear like that of a monster and finds blood all around. She feels her nightmare has changed and even become more revolting now. She calls out to let the training from hell begin. Lin Kai stands out of the building hostile and says there must be something off with Zinkun. Jemai's Vu comes from behind and says to Lin Kai that the captain was right when she instructs him to stick to him. He says do not say that he is going to peek into the shower of the little sister. Lin Kai tells Jemai's Vu that Zinkun's room is emitting an aura. 
Jamais Vu asks him if he is a dog. Lin Kai says Zing Kun is the blue flame and he will expose his true colors during the selection of supernovas. Their cell phones beep and they receive an emergency call. They receive the news that the North District Supply Station has been attacked. The informer says that all the nearby exterminators are required for relief. The scene shifts to the support location of Qing Chu City's northern station. One of the exterminators reports that most of the floors of the building have gone the smell of blood is strong on the site, and there is not a sign of any survivor. He says from the signs they inferred that there is a monster outbreak, though there are no signs of monsters themselves. He further informs headquarters that the four beauty exterminators team is immediately launching an investigation, and they are hoping to find the survivors. The headquarters asks them to remain vigilant and says that the headquarters has not observed any significant movement from the monsters in the vicinity. The man says they are the team that assisted Shang Guangqiui in killing the Earth Dragon so they can at least defend themselves. He says the monsters do not appear to be there, they should not underestimate his hearing transcended skill. He then feels something and says there is a strange sound emitting from a distance of 1,800 or might be 400 meters. He says the sound is getting close quickly. He asks his team to get ready for the battle. They ask him where the monsters are. He tells the monsters he can hear are now just 10 meters away. A sharp blue light comes out of the heap of debris of the demolished building. He says he cannot see anything. The man's voice from the headquarters can be heard from the headphones that are lying on the ground. One of them asks Ziolan if it is invisible, if is it a monster. One of them calls out to form dragon ceiling formation in all directions and tells the exterminators to prioritize their security. One of them says she cannot block it and adds the invisible monster seems like a fourth grade monster. Ame applies her mercury trap eruption by sacrificing her blood and forming a blood prison cage all around. One of his comrades says she should not do this, they just need to hold on for some time, the headquarters has already issued a notice to all the nearby exterminators and they will arrive soon. She tells her team to listen carefully and says that her blood cage prison would not last for long, the monster can turn invisible and the monster is at least in the fourth stage minimum. She says they would not last until the other comes to rescue them and even if they do it may well be a death sentence for them. She says she cannot hold on any longer. She asks others to join her as they have cultivated the same star chart. She says if they join her in the blood cage, then they can at least save the life of their captain. She says he has always protected them now it is their turn to protect him. She asks the captain to surrender and says he is completely powerless when they all join together. The captain asks them to stop and listen to him. They say he is the captain and he has to stay alive otherwise all of them will die. They throw him aside to save him and ask him to inform the headquarters to send experts for help. They say do not let the death of them go in vain. Captain Song tries to get stability. He sees exterminators forming a spiral in the air and thinks he could have protected him if he was a strong person. He takes out his cell phone and says that he has to reach a safe place and inform the headquarters. He feels similar voices nearby. He gets to know there are more invisible monsters there. He thinks their speed is not as fast as before because they are trailing behind. He wonders where all these monsters coming from and says there is too much going on in the mission. He says there is no time to find a safe place, he should immediately inform the headquarters. He dials the number on the cell phone but finds there is no network there. He says the elemental power in the air is so strong that it is even affecting the signals. He says he needs to run fast. He feels flashing footsteps behind him and says that he has been spotted by the monsters. He tries many times to call the headquarters but due to the unavailability of the network fails to do so. Then he finally succeeds in connecting with the headquarters and informs them that there are at least three invisible monsters there and tells them not to send anyone there. After sending the report to headquarters he says now he does not care even if he dies. He says he can sense an opportunity for the awakening of the elemental genes and rebirth of life. He says after headquarters sent the information, the fastest one to arrive here must be Shang Guangqiui. Shang Guangqiui says she is sorry that she is late. The captain tells her to be careful. She says the monsters are gone. She says although she regrets that their attack on him was just for fresh meat. She says they must be afraid of wasting their time and revealing their whereabouts since they ignored her. She adds these terrifying monsters must have some important goals. The scene shifts to Ji Yu's room. 
Zinkun says after adapting to transcended genes humans believed that they had control over the monsters thinking that they could again dominate them. He mutates into his monster self and growls. He says without excitement transcended individuals would not have the time to grow. He says when a sudden disaster arrives after a year they all will become defenseless. He says he needs to agitate both of them. He holds Jiao Sheng with his mutated hand. He says it feels so eerie and licks. Ji Yu tells him to resist the temptation of eating him. He says she should not worry if he cannot resist the urge to eat, the first one he eats will be her as she is tastier than them. She calls him a scum. He tells Ji Yu that he did not implant any monster flesh and blood in her body last time, because her transcended genes might have gone berserk if he had done so. But with those who have less amount of transcended genes that method becomes viable. She asks him what sort of dreams they had. He says Zayorao's dream was quite normal like a typical response when someone is afraid. However, Zhao Shang's dream was strange, it seemed like the boy had immense anger inside him. Zhao Shang wakes up and shouts he will kill someone. Xin Kun congratulates them and tells them they have awakened. Both of them become shocked on hearing that. Zhao Shang again becomes sentimental and says that he will not forget his immense kindness and become his shield. He bows before Xin Kun. Xin Kun says he is still away long from that and tells him to level up quickly. He tells them that he has left something in their bodies that placed their transcended gene in a berserk state. He asks them to imagine that they are about to be eaten, and their adrenaline surges placing them in a crazy survival mode. Zayotao asks if is it activating their transcended genes. Xin Kun says something like that. He says that there are only two weeks left for the supernova selections within this week both of them have to upgrade themselves to the three-star rank. He adds with their current state of being it is not difficult for them to be two stars. He says as far as the chart is concerned to upgrade to three star, he and Yu will get it from the Dean. He instructs them not to drink water only drink life essence in the next few days if they feel thirsty. Jiao Sheng asks Xiaoten if is he dreaming or if they have awakened. He says he feels like the transcended genes are going crazy in his body. He says he has never seen any such thing in the two years since he entered this school. He adds that drinking life essence as water is also surprising. He says the big brother is sentimental, righteous and amazingly strong. He then says to Xiaotao that her judgment of the people is amazing. She asks if Zinkun just mentioned about supernova selections. She says do not tell her that he wants them to participate in the competition. He says they will do whatever big brother asks them to do and it is just supernova selection. He says Big Brother is amazing, they now have the qualifications to participate in the competition. She says he is low-key in terms of continuation of study, but he should not forget what he did in the last term. He asks her if did not he beat all of his classmates. She says then he should remember that they are going to meet all of them in the supernova. He says he is thankful that they are awakened. One week passes and the supernova selections begin. One boy finds another drinking life essence drink and asks him where he got it. He replies who else could do that and tells him that he has stolen the vitals from Jiaosheng's worn out pair of shoes. The boy asks him if he stole it from him and if is not he afraid of offending him. He says why should he be afraid of him. He says Jiaosheng is just a lackey from the team of Jiu, he must have gotten the vitals from licking their boots. He says that their boss is from the fan family. He tells the boy that dealing with Zhao Sheng is part of the mission given by the Fan family. He says Zhao Sheng is a coward and useless as he has not even returned to the room after he beat him last time. He adds no one knows where is he. He says even Zhao Sheng acts up his boss Jiu little bratty will be controlled by Fan Shizai in the future. He says he has not even awakened, yet he is afraid that he might beat him to death if he finds him in one-on-one -on -one fight. Wyan tells the boy not to underestimate Zhao Sheng. The boy asks Wine if he regrets leaving Zhao Sheng after seeing him have so many Vita of life essence fluid. He says if he also wants to lick their boots then he has so many fence sitters like him. He says to Wine that he will return to his senses after getting a few kicks from him. Wine tells him to check the campus network and asks if he knows that it is the supernova selections today. He says of course he knows that as it is a big deal and the school has installed so many cameras in the field. He says students can watch it from the screens and he is planning to go to the auditorium to watch on the big screen. He checks the campus network from his phone and says it has already started. He says the host is quite good looking, he knows her she is the captain of the champion team which won the competition last time. 
the host is a wind attribute transcended who is also a million followers internet sensation. Wearing a rabbit hairband, the host jumps in the air and introduces the most arrogant team in the competition. Then she asks permission to introduce the top three teams with a high chance of winning. She introduces Team 23 Crimson Flames and tells the audience that all the members of that team are fire attribute transcenders. She says on top of being three star ranked their cultivation rate is 50%. She says the team has the highest cultivation overall. She says the former captain of the team Zhang Yu has 86% transcended genes. She says according to the reliable resources the captain of the strongest team has changed. She adds now the most anticipated freshman, Fan Shizai, the heir of the Fan family, a three-star transcender with an 83% cultivation rate and 90% transcended genes, a team age prodigy with a promising future, is the new captain of the team. She introduces the next team the Rootbreakers and tells that the team consists of all female warriors. She flows towards them and says that Captain Zhang Ying with 85% of transcended genes is recognized as the strongest in school student. She says she is the senior sister of extinction cultivating the myriad sword chart and says her attribute is water. She says she is infamous for shattering the pants of the previous captain of the Crimson Flames with one slash. She asks if will she be able to maintain the same status. She says finally now there is a little treat for the female fans. She introduces Captain Xiao He with his team shield and sword. She tells the audience that it is said that they possess the strongest sword and shield below the four stars. She says their fans from her live chart are saying they are the most contenting team in the competition. Then she says as the host of the competition she officially announces the beginning of the first round of the competition. She says the forest is the stage for the competition, and there are a total of 16 teams in the competition. She says if the captain of any team becomes unable to fight that team will be doomed to disqualify. She says the remaining six teams will advance to the next round. One of the first-year students wonders that if the top three teams are that awesome what about the team that is described as the most arrogant team in the competition? The boy asks Wyan that is he watching the live streaming from the beginning. He asks Wyan how exactly that so-called most arrogant team showed off. Wyan tells them it is a team of first-year students with only four members, enough bravado to compete for the glory of the supernova against the second and third-year students. That is why Slaughter Rabbit dubbed them the most arrogant small dogs. The boy wonders and asks if is it Zinkun's team. Wine confirms that it is Zinkun's team. He wonders how they even qualify for the competition. He says he can understand the selection of Zhiyu with 95% of transcended genes, she might have undergone a breakthrough, but both Xiao Shang and Xiaotao are also in the team. He wonders how is that possible when all the team members are at least required to be awakened. Wyan says that he has awakened. He replies what matters even if he awakened, it took him two years to awake and he is still at his mercy with only 33% of transcended genes. He says it seems everyone is awakened these days. Wyan says Zhao Shang does have a low amount of transcended genes, he continued his studies for two years, but this means that he has been there for whole two years. He says he has been studying in the school for two straight years and asks him if he knows what sort of courses they offer in the school. Wyan tells him not only transcended related studies he has studied every course diligently as if his life depended on it. Wyan says to him that he might not know all the students from the previous year they call him brother Xiaosheng whenever they see him. The captain of the second year team Dark Horse shooting star Ma Zio looks at Xiaosheng and Zio Tao and says he has not seen them for a long time. He says to Jia Sheng that he had never expected that he would meet him in the supernova and asks him if he remembers the day when he beat all of them and leave the school. With a big group of students on his back, he says when they saw he appeared there every member of the 24 batch since none of them joined third year team find their way towards him. He says since he is there that means he has awakened. He says their team took on such an arrogant name. He adds after careful deliberation they all agreed to settle with a beating one on one fight. Zinkun puts his hand on Jia Sheng's shoulder and says that he did not expect him to attract more hatred than him. Zinkun comes forward and says all these people seem lacking. One of the second year students gets mad and asks when his turn to speak comes. One of the teachers asks Bo Yang if he still wishes to bet on the freshman team making it through the first round. He says six teams are made up of second year students. X they are a total of 30 people. All of the teachers bet that the first-year students will not make it through the first round. 
One of them asks Bo Liang if he can face the consequences of that. Bo Liang replies of course he can. He asks Bo Liang what is the meaning of the name of the team he is selecting. He says it is not trendy to talk about the end of the world in this apocalyptic world. The second year students make fun of the name of their team, Doomsday Starlight, and ask them if there is some sort of curse suggesting that the world is about to end and they are the saviors. They say what an arrogant youth they are. They say it is not entirely unjustified to be labeled as the most arrogant small dog by the slaughter rabbit. Zinkun thinks Starlight kindles flames, alone he cannot save the world. He says before the apocalypse arrives he must allow the spark around him to ignite. That is why he needs to add some fuel to the starlight Zinkun also ridicules second-year students and says is not he overvaluing them by calling a single battle. He says they will only stand a chance if they all come together.